so and uh, i i really uh, welcome to all of you and i am thankful to all of you uh, for showing your wide interest in the form of your research uh, you know abstract so with this uh, now i would like to request uh, professor rk sukla sir the convener of the uh, conference chair of this national conference uh, to give his you know welcome address to the audience sir thank you dr dk yadav ji uh, good morning to everyone connected here i welcome all the participants and esteemed speaker to this national conference on advancements in interdisciplinary research organized by islamia pg college and science tech institute this conference would not be possible without uh, your contribution so a heartful thank you to all participants this type of conference is an opportunity to get in touch with recent latest and cutting edge development in global research i believe that the participant will benefit immensely from these invited talks online on zoom platform i welcome professor mp singh sir today chief guest of this conference at this conference there are 20 invited talks and 180 oral and poster presentation more than 200 participants are registered in this conference at this conference there are some awards these awards boost the research scholar to further work in the field of research we are planning to publish a book with isbn through our organization if you are interested to contribute a book chapter then you submit your full length paper i would like to thank mr jafar jilani ji manager islamia pg college for allowing us to hold this conference i would like to thank dr abdul qayyum principal islamia pg college dr dilshad ansari dr dk yadav dr misa singh ms swetha singh and all organizing members again i thank all organizing team members participants and esteemed speaker i wish the conference great success jai hind jai bharat thank you sir thank you for your enlightening words and uh, we can say that uh, without your motivation and encouragement it's not possible to organize such a huge event uh, which is uh, you can see that uh, we uh, have received around 180 research abstracts so it's a uh, you know big achievement for all of us so now uh, i request uh, dr sk singh the co convener of this conference and uh, the director of science tech institute who is the person behind all the technical support uh, which is providing for this national conference to say the inaugural note for the audience thank you dr dharmin sir uh, good morning to all of you uh, first of all i great thanks to manager of amrit dawla islamia degree college mr jafar abdulani is a senior advocate and uh, ex general advocate government of uttar pradesh and uh, assistant manager mr atah nabi sahab and program chair professor r k sukla sir and convener of this ncir 2022 Dr. Dilshad Ahmed Ansari and organizing secretary of this conference, Dr. Dharmendra Yadav and Dr. Neha Singh, uh, she is the senior scientist of virology lab, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, and uh, Dr. Rajiv Ratan Singh uh, from RML Lucknow and. i would like to thanks to all the participants for joining this uh, national conference on advancement of interdisciplinary research and today our chief guest professor anv singh sir uh, he is long from sarada university and he is the emeritus professor in that university so i over to you dr dharmen please continue thank you dr singh for your Uh, all the support uh, which is required for conducting this type of you know <coughs> conference so with this now i would like to request our uh, uh, one of our you know organizing secretary uh, dr neha singh 
Dr. Neha is a senior scientist at uh, uh, Virology Lab, Pandit Jawala Nehru Medical College, Raipur, Chhattisgarh, and she is closely associated with our, uh, you know, Kaisteg Institute and uh, our society. And uh, thanks uh, for being with us, Madam. Please. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for your invitation. Uh, so, uh, good morning to all of you and uh, a very warm welcome to all the participants. Uh, so, this is Dr. Neha from PTGNM Medical College, Raipur. And uh, I uh, really uh, feel honored to be a part of this uh, national conference, which is uh, organized by MKS uh, Educational Society uh, and uh, in association uh, with the Amiruddala Degree College, uh, Lucknow, UP. So I believe that uh, in the era of COVID-19, uh, conducting such kind of online workshop and conferences are uh, really very helpful uh, for all the new researchers, scientists, and the faculties. And uh, uh, those are very helpful to connect uh, all of uh, us uh, uh, over one single platform where we can share our uh, new ideas, our view, and uh, which will be very helpful to conduct uh, uh, different kind of uh, research uh, in future. So uh, with these words, uh, I'm uh, very thankful to uh, Chairperson Dr. Uh, R.K. Shukla sir and uh, our uh, Chief Guest uh, Dr. N.B. Singh sir and uh, convener of this uh, uh, conference Dr. Dilshad Ansari sir and uh, Dr. Uh, Sushil and uh, Dr. Dharmendra uh, sir, uh, like organizing secretary of this national conference. And uh, Dr. Uh, Shweta Singh, uh, she is the president of MKSS Society. So uh, thank you all of you. And I'm also thankful to all uh, 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 person who are directly or indirectly connected uh, with this conference. So uh, thank you all of you. and. Uh, I wish all the very best uh, to all the participants for uh, upcoming three days. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Neha, for your you know, support and, you know, valuable input so whenever we require from your side. So uh, with this, uh, now I would like to invite uh, the person who is, uh, you know, behind all this activity for the organizing you know, this uh, national conference, uh, I can say that uh, without him, uh, without his support or active uh, efforts, it was not possible to conduct this uh, you know, national conference. So with this now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Dilshad Ahmed Ansari. Uh, he's a convener of uh, this national conference. And uh, he is a associate professor in the Amirud Dola Islamia Degree College, Lucknow. So for uh, giving the vote of thanks to all the participants and all the dignitaries. So Dr. Dilshad Ahmed. Thank you. Good morning. National Conference on Advancement in Interdisciplinary Research, NCAIR 2020. Last time for 2021, it was one year ago. And at that time, we were 257 colleagues affiliated, the, associated. Today, we have 527. In which we have four cities and Rai Bareli, Sitapur, लखीमपुर है और आपका हरदोई है तो इन सब लोग सारे जिले जुल जाने से हमारा जो है एरिया काफी बड़ा हो गया है और 102 साल के बाद जो है लखनऊ यूनिवर्सिटी में जो है नए कवि कराया गया है जिसमें सभी लोग बिजी थे शुक्ला जी भी हमारे इसमें मौजूद हैं काफी बिजी रहे हैं और इनको ए प्लस प्लस का ग्रेड मिला हुआ है जिसको जिसके लिए हम वहां के कुलपति प्रोफेसर आलोक राय जी को और हमारी जो कुलाधिपति माननीय आनंदी बहन पटेल जिन्होंने ये कहा कि हमारे लिए एक गौरव का विषय है और सभी के लिए एक जो है एक आइडियल होगा कि हमारे यहाँ उत्तर प्रदेश में पहली बार जो है प्लस प्लस मिला है सबको उससे जो है प्रथा हासिल करना करना चाहिए हमारा कॉलेज 108 साल पुराना है 1916 में हाई स्कूल 1942 में इंटर हो गया था और 1991 में जिसमें रूप से चलने आज नर्सरी से लेके डिग्री तक की सारी कक्षाएं चल रही हैं इस प्रोग्राम में जो हमारे जो पैटर्न है जफर याब जिरानी साहब उनको कोई बताने की जरूरत नहीं है इंटरनेशनल पर्सनालिटी हैं और सभी उनको जानते हैं 
और पिछली बार वो तबीयत उनकी खराब हो गई थी गिर गए थे उनको चोट लग गई थी उसके बाद उन्होंने जो है अभी तक चार्ज नहीं दिया है उनका इलाज चल रहा है उनकी जगह पर सैयद अतहर नबी साहब ने जो है चार्ज दिया है वो हमारे जो असिस्टेंट मैनेजर भी हैं इसके अलावा जो हमारा जो कोलेबोरेशन है है साइंस इंस्टीट्यूट से जो एक अंतर्राष्ट्रीय संगठनों के लिए सहयोग के लिए शैक्षणिक गतिविधियों में जिसमें सम्मेलन है सेमिनार है कार्यशाला है प्रशिक्षण कार्यक्रम का आयोजन कर रही है और कोविड आया है तब से इन्होंने बिना किसी आर्थिक सहायता के जो है पैंतालीस इन्होंने इवेंट करा चुके हैं और देश की ये पहली संस्था है बिना किसी सहायता के ये काम लगातार करती चली आ रही है और कोविड की जब से ये महामारी पैदा हो गई है तब से जो है ऑफलाइन जो है बहुत मुश्किल से चल पाता है लोगों का आना जाना दुनिया भर की चेकिंग वगैरह सब होती है जिसकी वजह से ये प्रोग्राम इस तरीके से नहीं हो पा रहा है तो ये ये ऑनलाइन प्लेटफॉर्म जो मिला है जो शोधार्थियों के लिए बहुत ही फायदेमंद होगा और जो टेक्नोलॉजी का इस्तेमाल करते हुए और हम इस प्रोग्राम को आगे चलाने के लिए हमने इनके साथ जो है टाइप किया हुआ है सक्सेसफुली तो प्रोग्राम पिछली बार भी चला है इस बार भी चल रहा है और इस हमारे जो है कॉलेज के जो है रेनाउंड पर्सनालिटी जो है अतर नबी साहब जो इसी कॉलेज के पढ़े हुए भी हैं उनके बारे में थोड़ा सा मैं बताना चाहूँगा सैयद अतर नबी साहब जो है एडवोकेट रहे हैं और उनका जो हरदोई जो जिला जुआ है वह लखनऊ से उन्हीं वहीं से संबंध है गदनपुर एक गांव है वहाँ के जमींदार घराने के हैं इनके पिता मोहम्मद एक मशहूर वकील थे जो कि अपनी ईमानदारी के इतने चर्चित से उन्होंने अपनी वकालत छोड़ दी और उन्होंने जो है एक किताब लिखी मैंने वकालत क्यों छोड़ी है और उसके बाद फिर हमारे यहाँ ये असिस्टेंट मैनेजर है इसके बाद हमारे अतर नबी साहब ने जो है चार्ज दिया पिछली बार जफर याब जिलानी साहब थे और इस जो एक्टिंग के रूप मैनेजर के रूप में आजकल काम कर रहे हैं ये इस्लामिया कॉलेज में जो है बहुत ही होनहार रहे यहाँ इन्होंने क्रिकेट भी काफ़ी खेला इनके जो है देख रहे में काफ़ी जगहों से इन्होंने मैच भी खूब जीत पाए और संस्कृत प्रोग्रामों में इनका जो है नाम सदैव आगे रहता है कॉलेज में प्रत्येक वर्ष एजुकेशन वीक मनाया जाता जाता रहता था जब ये पढ़ते थे यहाँ पर इंटर तक की मैं बता रहा हूँ आप इन्हें जो है अत्यंत सराहनीय कार्य करते हुए उच्च शिक्षा में जो है बी ए एम यही लखनऊ यूनिवर्सिटी से की लेकिन एल एल करने के बाद भी इन्होंने वकालत नहीं की आप पिछले जो है चार दशकों से साहित्य और रंगमंच के कार्यक्रम से जुड़े हैं जो एक अच्छे और कामयाब ऑर्गेनाइजर के तौर पर जाने जाते हैं जिसकी वजह से एक अंतर्राष्ट्रीय पहचान है आपने एक ही मंच पर बड़ी बड़ी फिल्मी हस्तियों साहित्यकारों और रंगमंच एवं नाट्य अभिलेखों के साथ लाने का इन्होंने काम काम किया है तो अतर नबी साहब जो है उर्दू का एक बहुत बड़ा शायर शायर और हिंदी और कवि और लेखकों और आलोचकों के लिए लखनऊ में एक जमघट से इकट्ठा किया करते थे जिसके लिए वो सम्मानित भी लोगों को करते थे अपने आपने लखनऊ में गालिब सदी के नाम से मनाए जो हाँ पर अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर साहित्य प्रोग्राम किया इसमें उस वक्त के तत्कालीन उपराष्ट्रपति जी ने शिरकत की और प्रोग्राम बहुत ही ज्यादा सक्सेसफुल हुआ इसके अलावा लखनऊ में इन्होंने जो है बड़े बड़े फिल्मी हस्तियों को जो बुला के जो है काम उनको सम्मानित किया जिसमें जो है आपके अभिनय सम्राट जो है दिलीप कुमार हैं लता मंगेशकर हैं मजरू सुल्तानपुरी हैं साहिर लुधियान भी हैं कैफी आजमी हैं और अमिताभ बच्चन अली सरदार जाफरी शबाना आजमी और गीतकार जावेद अख्तर आदि को इन्होंने जो है और और इन्होंने जो है अपने मंच पे इनको सम्मानित किया है तो ये हमारे इस वक्त वर्तमान में जो मैनेजर हैं और पूरी तरीके से देख रहे हैं वो इसमें इनके अंडर में जो है मुमताज पी जी कॉलेज अनुमन इस्लाहम इस्लाहमसलम ये सारे कॉलेज भी अच्छी तरीके से चला रहे हैं इसके अलावा जो हमारे प्रोग्राम में जो एडवाइजरी कमेटी में जिन्होंने हमारा सहयोग दिया हमारे कॉलेज के डॉक्टर मोहम्मद साजिद साहब हैं तबस्सुम हैं और नसीम सिद्दीकी साहब हैं इन लोगों ने जो प्रोग्राम दिया जो हमारे यहाँ के स्पीकर जो इसमें आज बोलने के लिए तीन दिन जो कार्यक्रम चलेगा प्रोफेसर आरजी आरजी यादव हैं प्रोफेसर अनिल मिश्रा है जे जे एस सैनी है 
और अनूप कुमार जी हैं एस के यादव जी हैं यूसुफ अख्तर हैं डॉक्टर विनीत कुमार हैं शिव कुमार मिश्रा जी हैं शैलेश कौशल जी हैं धर्मेंद्र यादव जी हैं अशोक मिश्रा जी हैं रविंद्र सिंह जी हैं के पी मिश्रा हैं डॉक्टर नेहा मिश्रा हैं डॉक्टर शिवा सेठी जी हैं जो पिछली बार इस प्रोग्राम को इन्होंने कंडक्ट कंडक्ट भी कराया था ये हमारे इस पर जिन दिन का भी हम अपनी तरफ से बहुत ही तहे दिल से शुक्रिया अदा करते हैं क्योंकि ये हमारे प्रोग्राम में ये इन्होंने जो है आने वाले प्रोग्रामों में इनकी स्पीच आने की होगी जो कि जो रिसर्चर्स हैं उनके लिए उनको मार्गदर्शन का काम करेगा इसके अलावा हमारे जो है जो यूनियन के अध्यक्ष हैं डॉक्टर मनोज पांडे हैं सेक्रेटरी एसोसिएटिया है जफर याब जिलानी साहब हैं हमारे प्रिंसिपल के जो है डॉक्टर अब्दुल कयूम साहब हैं इन लोगों ने जो है पूरा सहयोग दिया है और इस कर को ज़्यादा समय न लेते हुए मैं घर में सर से मैं आग्रह करूँगा कि इस कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाएं और हमारे जो है गेस्ट एम डी सिंह साहब बैठे जो पिछली बार भी हमने सुना था हमारे बच्चे जितने जुड़ते हैं वो बहुत सराहते हैं उनकी बहुत ही सरल भाषा में जो अंग्रेजी का इस्तेमाल करते हैं बहुत अच्छा इनको अप्रीशिएट करते हैं हमारी तरफ से आपको बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और कार्यक्रम को आप आगे इस तरह से कंटिन्यू रखते हैं थैंक यू सर thank you thank you dr sir ahmed sir for your uh, wide introduction about you know different domains you can say that uh, about the conference about the lucknow and about the personalities so you have covered all the you know aspect of lucknow lucknow with ajib you can say because i am also belonging from lucknow and yes yes uh, lucknow university is uh, my alma mater so it's really a proud moment for all of us uh, that uh, lucknow university become the first state university who has secured nac a++ grade yes, yes. so thanks to all of you and congratulations to all of you so uh, with this uh, now we are uh, you know the in the final stage you can say that about this inaugural session so with this now i would like to uh, you know welcome our the chief guest of this inaugural session and the conference uh, professor nv singh sir so professor singh is a you know renowned academician and researcher who is known across the you know world a uh, globe so professor nv singh sir is presently he is a former head and department of chemistry and former dean faculty of science at dean dayal padhyay gorakhpur university gorakhpur he is presently working as emeritus professor in the school of basic sciences and research at sharda university greater noida dr singh was post doctoral fellow at free university of brussels belgium during 1973 to 74 and he received the most prestigious alexander von a humboldt fellowship in germany in 1977 and has worked at different universities in germany his main areas of research are solid state chemistry material chemistry material science cement chemistry thermodynamics and water purification professor singh has published more than 290 research publications authored eight books and uh, written 25 book chapters in edited books published by Xavier and Springer he has supervised 41 phd students he is a member of different academic bodies all over the globe so he is a renowned i, I have i have seen that uh, renowned academician and researcher who is always a great source of motivation for all the young researchers so thank you so much sir for being with us whenever we require your guidance and motivation so thanks for coming on this platform and giving your blessings so we welcome you sir to say few words about this conference uh, thank you dr yadav uh, very good morning to all of you i am extremely thankful to each and every one who is present here are associated with this program and the office bearers of the organizing committee i would like to say only two three sentences i would say there was a time when education was knowledge oriented only now today education is knowledge oriented plus outcome based and because of these philosophies the national education policy 2020 has also emphasized that a student can take one subject of one stream and he can also take another subject of another stream 
that's why this conference which is on multidisciplinary area is very timely and as per line of the national education policy and i hope that the participants who will be attending this conference or who will be delivering this conference will be benefited a lot because today's time research cannot be done in isolation uh, it has to be associated with different disciplines different areas and i am sure that the purpose of the conference is also to associate different academicians of different discipline so that something new can emerge out i congratulate the organizers organizing committee and all the members who are associated with this program for a grand success of the conference thank you very much thank you so much sir for your enlightening words and motivation so the motivation of the great researcher and academicians uh, you know can provide the valuable inputs uh, which will uh, you know wait for all of us to organize such events in the future so thank you so much sir for being with us uh, so now uh, we are uh, just uh, going to the end of this inaugural session of this three day national conference so once again i i welcome to all of you all the researchers who is connected uh, across the india different parts of india so dr singh you have any announcement yeah please unmute yourself uh, yeah yeah sure uh, we can go ahead i think uh, we can start uh, as our program schedules we can go ahead thank you okay so so with this uh, uh the first you know you can say that this session which is uh, delivered by your keynote address uh, by professor nb singh sir the chief guest of today's session so uh, professor singh will deliver his uh, keynote address on green synthesized <laughs> silver nanoparticles preparation properties and applications so welcome uh, allow me to share yes sure uh is it visible yes sir yes sir yes sir okay uh whenever you feel that i am taking more time you can stop me yes sir uh, uh very good morning to all of you and uh, the chairperson of this conference and the session the title of my talk is green silver nano particles its preparation properties and applications materials material science and material scientist play a very vital role in the development of a country properties of materials are size dependent you see that if you want to talk about the development of any nation materials are very important whenever you talk about the development of a nation you would like to talk about the construction of roads construction of bridges construction of buildings electronic industry and many more industries where materials are required and that too advanced materials nowadays 
material scientists claim that 21st century is the century of materials and especially nanomaterials. <clears throat> it is rightly said that those who control materials control technology. Development of society depends on materials, no materials, no progress. Material science and engineering innovations will continue to have a pivotal role as an enabling resource to address sustainable developmental needs and perhaps nanomaterials may play a very important role. <clears throat> During the annual meeting of the American Physical Society in 1959 at California Institute of Technology, Caltech, the American physicist and Nobel laureate, Richard Feynman, introduced the concept of nanotechnology in a lecture entitled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. So I would say that a systematic development and nomenclature of the word nano started from this very lecture. Now the word nano is taken from the Greek word nanos, meaning dwarf. It is a prefix used to describe one billionth of something and represented by 10 power minus nine. So whenever we write 10 power minus nine meter, it means one nanometer. We can, for students, we can give the concept how big or how small a nanometer is. You take one meter, divide by 1000, you'll get 10 power minus three meter. Further divide by 1000, you'll get 10 power minus six meter. Then further you divide by 1000, you'll get 10 power minus nine meter, which is said to be one nanometer. To have a physical concept, the diameter of one hydrogen atom is 0 0.1 nanometer approximately. Particles less than 100 nanometer in diameter are said to be nanomaterials, and the study of science of such material is called nanoscience. In general, when particles go below 100 nanometer in size, there is a drastic change in properties. Therefore, in general, 100 nanometer is considered to be the limit for defining nanomaterial. Nanotechnology is the design, characterization, production, and application of structures, devices, and system by controlling shape and size at nanometer scale. Now the question is, why do we want to make things small? To make products smaller, cheaper, faster, and better by scaling them down. And the applications are in electronics, catalysis, water purification, solar cell, coating, life science, and many more. To introduce new physical phenomena for science and technology, quantum behavior, and other effects. That is when the particles goes below certain size, there is 100 nanometer, there is a quantum confinement, so new physical principle or chemical principle emerge. What's interesting about the nanoscience, nano-sized particles exhibit different properties than larger particles of the same substance. Say, for example, I will mention a little later, gold, which is a macro size, is golden in color, golden yellow in color but when it goes to nano size, it may change different colors. As we study phenomena at this scale, we learn more about the nature of matter, develop new theories, discover new questions and answers in many areas, including healthcare, energy and technology, figure out how to make new products and technologies that can improve people's lives. Nanoscience and nanotechnology has a revolutionary potential and will have significant economic benefits, but at the same time, there are ethical, legal, social, and environmental issues to be addressed. Therefore, in totality, if you are going to study or use nanomaterial, you have to take into consideration all these aspects which I just mentioned. Now, nanomaterials basically can be prepared by two routes, 
top down approach and bottom up approach bottom up approach is a chemical method whereas top down approach is a physical method but now today's time considering many factors in bottom up approach green methodology is being used in green methodology either the nano materials are being mixed by parts of the plants or by microbes that for example we can use steam flower leaf fruit seed of the plants bacteria algae fungus from the microbes in general we can divide the nano materials into four categories zero dimensional cluster and spheres one dimensional nano rods and wires two dimensional nano films and plates and three dimensional solid bar the traditional method for producing nano particles are costly poisonous and unfriendly to the environment to solve these issues scientists have discovered green bars are naturally occurring sources and their materials that can be used to synthesize nano particles the source of green synthesis may be microorganisms such as fungi bacteria plants and plant extract viruses dna etc the advantages of green approach such as environmentally friendly simple and low operating cost has brought out the preference may, may i ask to mute please towards synthesis of nano particles moreover green synthesis fulfills the principles of green chemistry to preserve a sustainable environment <clears throat> there are 12 principles of green chemistry which are inherently safer chemistry for accident prevention waste prevention atom economy less hazardous chemical synthesis designing safer chemicals safer solvents and auxiliaries designed for energy efficiency use of renewable of feed stock reduced derivative used in catalysis designed for degradation real time analysis for pollution prevention so these are the basic principles of green chemistry method number of plants their flowers and seeds can be used for the preparation of nano materials using green root when we use nano this plant materials either plant leaf seed flower they contain a large number of chemicals which are known as phytochemicals some of the chemicals are listed in this slide and the chemicals found in the plant body they are said to be phytochemicals in a similar way microbial chemicals there are a lot of materials selenium dna template protein antigen streptin lot of compounds are available now these compounds which are either phytochemicals or microbial materials they are used as a reducing agent for making the nano materials and at the same time they are acting or they act as a capping agent also green synthesis of nano materials can be done by any method which are listed here say for example plants microorganism these are the two major sources for the preparation of nano materials through green root but there are many other methods like microwave heating laser heating hydrothermal method sono chemical method electrochemical method green catalysis method biological method salvo thermal method biopolymer waste solvent replacement method all these are considered to be green root for the synthesis of nano material but major focus has been given on the preparation from the plant material or plant extract or from micro organism there are number of advantages of green synthesis of nano materials say for example non toxic chemicals chemicals obtained from plants or microbe they are non toxic in nature self reducing and capping agent that is from the same chemical you can have a reducing agent property as well as they have a capping agent property cost is very low low cost energy saving ambient experimental conditions 
eco-friendly. So these are the benefits of green root for the preparation of nanomaterials. Kaiping agent, what is the significance of Kaiping agent? You see that nanomaterials are very tiny particles and when they are together, they agglomerate. And due to agglomeration, the size increases. Now, if the surface of the nanomaterials are covered with certain other material, then the agglomeration is restricted or the agglomeration is hindered. Such materials which do that job are said to be kaiping agents. And in the plant extract, the reducing agent acts as a reducing agent. And at the same time, it acts as a kaiping agent also. So kaiping agents are widely employed in the colloidal synthesis and stabilization of the nanoparticles and play a crucial role in controlling particle size, morphology, agglomeration, surface energy, grain growth, dispersion, and electrostatic and steric hindrance by providing a specific functional groups on the surface of nanoparticles. That is, they cover the surface, provide a specific functional group, which hinders the agglomeration and make the nanoparticle more reactive also. Many synthetic protocols reported to date rely heavily on the use of heteroatom functionalized lock chain hydrocarbons, which inevitably exert detrimental influence on the environment. The utilization of less hazardous and energy saving piping agents is therefore a pivotal importance in the nanoparticle synthesis that merits consideration in a green synthetic strategy for laboratory exploration and industrial production. For example, if we want to make silver nanoparticle by chemical method, then we use sodium citrate, a chemical as a reducing agent, and gallic acid as a kaiping agent. So here you see that the first, uh, this one is a gallic acid, gallic acid, and here you have sodium citrate. So you take a solution of silver nitrate, any salt of silver, particularly let us take silver nitrate, add sodium citrate and gallic acid, stir it. Then this sodium citrate reduces silver ion into nano size silver metal and this gallic acid covers the surface of this silver nanoparticle so it works as a kaiping agent and it hinders the agglomeration of silver nanoparticle and at the same time there are number of functional groups due to kaiping process on the surface of this nanoparticle which will make the material more reactive. Here, <clears throat> number of green sources are there, bacteria, plants, fungi, algae, and here you take some metal precursor like silver nitrate. Now, these are the chemicals which are present in these materials, that is the green material, you can say, and biological materials which are there, they reduce it and convert it into nanomaterial, and these chemicals are also adhered at the surface, they Kaibit and kaibit nanomaterial and nanoparticles are formed. Now, the biogenic kaiping agents, that is, all those kaiping agents, what they do, they prevent agglomeration, control particle size, biofunctionalization, and storage stability. Further, the kaiping agents, they work for anti inflammatory function antimicrobial, anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, drug delivery, wound healing, tissue engineering, gene delivery, bioimaging, diagnosis. Now, the properties of the nanomaterials depend on number of factors or number of parameters, you can say. Size of the particle, surface energy, number of surface atom, surface defects, surface functionalization, shape, surface area, aspect ratio, size and area aspect ratio, surface composition, and surface porosity, and many more are also there. 
nanotechnology is useful in number of disciplines say for example biotechnology transportation national security and defense food and agriculture medicine healthcare aerospace energy and environment advanced materials <clears throat> and textile information technology mechanical engineering and robotic and many more area i would say that particularly no discipline is left without the use of these nanomaterials nowadays now synthesis of silver nanoparticle silver nanoparticle can be made by any chemical or physical method but here we would like to emphasize on the green method and in the green synthesis we have used plant extract and microbial reductants <clears throat> Say for example, if you want to prepare silver nanoparticle by chemical route, what we do, we take a silver nitrate, add sodium borohydrate, immediately silver nanoparticle is formed, hydrogen gas and diborane is emitted out, and this diborane is hazardous for the environment. Now, in the green synthesis, what we do, we take the extract or the microbes. in the form of extract add to this to the silver nanoparticle or you can say uh, add this plus silver salt into a beaker stir it and then we get say and this silver nanoparticle can be characterized by number of technique like scanning electron microscopic technique transmission electron microscopic technique energy dis dispersive x ray technique FTIR spectroscopy, TGA, XRD, UV visible spectroscopy, all these techniques can be used for the characterization of silver nanoparticle. Here, if you simple method, you take neem leaf extract, mix with silver nitrate, immediately you get silver nanoparticles. Now here. changing the concentration and amount of neem leaf extract the color changes and now due to change in color this it is an indicator of the change of size of the nanoparticles now <clears throat> number of reducing and stabilizing agents have been used for the production of silver nanoparticle using green roots from plants or the microbes protein amino acid alkaloids alcohol polyphenols flavonoids vitamin and carbohydrate most of the plant extract contain polyphenol so this is a common reducing and capping agent now how the nanoparticles grow say for example you have a silver salt where silver plus iron is present now you add a reducing agent then the reduction first start a small nanoparticle is formed then it grows then there is a stabilization due to capping process of these materials now <clears throat> plant mediated synthesis it has lot of applications abundantly available eco friendly cost effective non toxic natural reducing agent natural capping agent safer solvent and reaction conditions now if we want to know whether silver nanoparticle has been formed or not what we do we prepare the nanoparticle let us say here is an uv visible spectra of silver nanoparticle synthesized through acacia catenacho onion tomato extract and the mixture of the three you take silver nitrate and add the extract from all these things you see that at around 430 you get a peak in the uv visual spectra and this peak is an indication that silver nanoparticle is formed now when the intensity of these peaks changes it is a correlation between the size of the nano silver nanoparticle and uh, there is a equation which can be used for determining the size now here see that if you change the concentration 
of the salt, you see that the intensity goes on decreasing. If you change the ratio of the extract and the salt, the intensity of the peak changes. If you change the pH of the medium, the intensity changes. If you change the duration of the formation of the nanoparticle, intensity changes. So depending all these factors, the size of the nanoparticle or particularly the size of the silver nanoparticle changes. This is the transmission electron microscope, the picture of silver nanoparticle. Now, <clears throat> the first one is spherical shape. And in the second, you say, you, if you see it minutely, you'll find rod, triangle, and quasi-spherical shape, silver nanoparticles are formed. This is the X-ray diffraction pattern of silver nanoparticle prepared by different plant extract onion, tomato, acrylia, and COT, you see that all have the same frequency, only the intensity is different, indicating that the size is there, uh, size is different. And with the Scherer formula, you can determine the crystallite size of the silver nanoparticle. Now, silver nanoparticle may have different shapes, a spherical shape silver nanoparticle, rod shaped silver nanoparticle, truncated shaped silver nanoparticle, triangular shaped silver nanoparticle. Here you see that different shapes by transmission electron microscope is given. Application of green synthesized silver nanoparticle. Green synthesized silver nanoparticle can be used in different disciplines for different applications. Electronics, production of flexible printed electronics, catalysis, synthesis of pharmaceutical molecules, production of hydrogen gas for fuel cell, healthcare, ointment, nail, paints, wound, dressing, uh, this catheters, dental fillers, and adhesive. Sci this uh, spectroscopy, energy, Raman spectroscopy, analytical tool to monitor low concentration, textiles, medical, environmental, food industry, everywhere we can use this uh, silver nanoparticle. Now, this silver nanoparticle has a strong antibacterial effect and therefore, the silver nanoparticle is being used since ages as an antibacterial agent. But as I pointed out in the beginning, that being a smaller size, it agglomerates. So in order to avoid agglomeration, silver nanoparticle is converted to silver nanocomposite, particularly with nanosilica. Nanosilica when mixed with silver nanoparticle, a nanosilver nanosilica nanocomposite is formed. Now, when this nanocomposite goes near to the bacteria, it ruptures the wall of the bacteria, enters inside, and combines with the DNA or pathogen or RNA and make them dead. Food packaging. The silver nanoparticles can be used for a food packaging material. Now you see that none of the foods can be preserved without using a food packaging material. Now, as the time goes on, advancement in different areas are going on. So different type of packaging materials are being used. And these nanoparticles, particularly silver nanoparticles, are used to have a smart packaging, active packaging, antimicrobial packaging, biodegradable packaging, eatable film, and intelligent packaging. Intelligent things mean there must be sensing property which can tell us about the stability and life of the food. Now, Silver nanoparticles are being used in refrigerators and washing machines. Use of silver nanoparticle in washing machines, refrigerator, or an air conditioning system to sterilize, removing bacteria and odors. Silver lasts for over 3,000 wash process for a 10 year time. Now, today's time, this uh, Bandage, cotton bandage are impregnated with silver nanoparticles synthesized by green root, which 
is used for uh, this uh, antibacterial bandages. Similarly, uh, hand gloves and uh, this uh, aprons used by the doctors, they also contain silver nanopartial. Emerging nanotechnology has been explored widely to combat chronic complications of diabetic wounds to repair completely the old ulcer. Here you see that this is a wound and for a diabetic patient. So there will be number of nanomaterial medical carrier, drug carrier, which when goes there, they cure the diabetic in a lesser time and silver nanoparticle is one of the most effective nanomaterial for that purpose. Nanomaterial, silver nanomaterials are used for different purposes in dentistry. In water purification, number of nanomaterials, including silver nanomaterials are being used, but when you use these nanomaterials, you have to take into consideration some parameters like technical criteria, economic criteria, experimental criteria, and social criteria. When you consider social criteria, health and safety risks should be taken into account. Water reuse potential should be taken into account. Public acceptance, initial investment, odor, noise, visual impact, release of chemical residue. When you consider economic criteria, byproduct recovery, treatment efficiency, process and agent stability, ease of operation, operating and maintenance cost, creation of solid waste. Uh, we can prepare silver nanoparticle by ginger. Say for example, ginger you take, and in the ginger, the compound is gingerol, which acts as a reducing agent, as well as a capping agent, and immediately the extract of the ginger converts the silver ion into silver nanoparticle. And these are the spectra, XRD, and the other things of the silver nanoparticle. Uh, recently, uh, this paper is uh, under communication. We prepared uh, silver nanoparticle by using floral waste from different temples nearby Sharda. We collected flowers from different temples, made an extract which contains uh, some compound like sugar or amide group compounds. And we mixed this extract with the silver nitrate solution and we found a silver nanomaterial. Now this silver nanomaterial which we prepared by floral extract acts as a very good sensor for detecting chromium-6 ion. Here you see that we have a uh, different type of uh, this uh, heavy metals, chromium-6, chromium-3, cobalt, arsenic, nickel, copper, manganese, and many more. And when we add this silver nanoparticle to this solution containing different type of heavy metals, you see that this peak at 327.67 is for chromium. Others are merged together. It is difficult to find out. So if there is a chromium in the solution, and if you add silver nitrate prepared by ground root, you get a peak showing that there is a presence of chromium 6 plus. So it acts as a sensor for chromium. Now, also we can prepare silver nit nanoparticles by, uh, can say, antimicrobial craft papers. What we do, we take uh, this surface coating of the soluble soya bean polysaccharide uh, and uh, add silver nitrate solution. It enters into the, then it reduces, it must punch me, reduces into silver nanoparticle. This nuclei of silver nanoparticle then coalesces, clusters are formed, growth, and then we coat it on a paper which become antimicrobial paper. So this silver nanoparticle is used for making antimicrobial paper. Coating for buildings. You see that <coughs> uh, 
particularly silver nanoparticle is very frequently used for hospital acquired uh, infections in hospitals patients use different type of drugs different type of bacteria and others are there and they is stuck at the surface of the wall and this wall when it is coated with a paint containing silver nanoparticle this kills the bacteria and save a lot of people there but here you see that this silver nanoparticles can be used for a coating and it acts as uv light protective coating anti covid coatings anti corrosion coating building coating textile industry impregnant coating anti fogging coating coating in space exploration anti shock insulating coating coating for aircraft engine nano coating for energy storage self cleaning coating paint depleting anti grafting coating and number of other areas where these nano material particularly silver nano particle can be used as a coating agent now at the end i would like to summarize uh, <clears throat> biological component itself acts as a reducing and capping agent therefore overall cost is reduced when we prepare silver nano particle by using green roof it is the method is eco friendly approach as toxic chemicals are not used external experimental conditions like high pressure are not required and leads to energy saving in normal method normally we heat it at high temperature so energy is consumed here in this method no temperature is required that we can perform the experiment at room temperature so energy saving is there now can be used at large scale production of nano particles this method although at the moment is being used at a laboratory scale but it can be used at a commercial level at a large scale where number of things cost energy and material will be decreased so thank you very much thank you sir for your very informative lecture now session is open for question if any person have any question or doubts please ask sir <clears throat> i think there is no question because you are uh, talking very simple way so all uh, participants are understand if they have any problem in future they uh, ask me and i contact you thank you sir i think i think from next time i should speak in a complex way <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir so thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you sir uh, now the our next speaker is professor nk pande Uh, he is a professor and head department of physics university of lucknow he is done phd uh, from uh, iit delhi on the topic studies on fiber optic sensors for monitoring pressure temperature and thermally stimulated discharge current and he is a life member of many academic bodies like material research society of india indian association of physics teachers laser and spectroscopy society of india Indian National Science Congress, Bihar Brain Society, Patna, International Academy of Physical Sciences, and he has completed uh, two projects uh, funded by UGC, and one uh, project is running, funded by government of uh, UP, and he has more than hundred research paper published in international journals, and he is uh, presented uh, more than fifty uh, paper in. Uh, international conferences and seminars he has delivered more than 50 invited talk and he has uh, got many awards from different uh, organization uh, he get a uh, best poster award uh, in many conferences and uh, he uh, began got a award by smart foundation in 2018 
is significant research award given by university of lucknow in 2017 he has many administrative responsibilities in uh, lucknow university he is a assessor for assessing the uh, universities and colleges for grading uh, he is a spokesperson of the university of lucknow he is director in many uh, places such as uh, he is director in ippr he is cultural activity board director he is coordinator of lucknow university student union and many other boards he is a member and uh, he is a very good administrator and uh, he is a uh, good uh, speaker and uh, he is a good administrator and he uh, uh, done every work very smoothly and sir, without sir bahut sir 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 bas bas sir now the sabne mein dr np singh baithe unke samne ye sab baatein mat kahiye i admire him a lot and uh, i have heard his lecture right now okay okay so uh, in fact uh, uh, earlier we used to say sir that if you have any uh, nobody is asking question and if you have a question you may interact uh, you may ask the question during the interaction session at the lunch or the dinner <laughs> so <laughs> right now we cannot say like that so uh, now i much. yes i now i request our professor nk pande to give on talk metal oxide nano materials for moisture sensing application yeah thank you professor rajesh shukla uh, for inviting me for this uh, conference and delivering a lecture so uh, i have tried to keep my lecture as i'm just uploading just wait a minute just give me a minute yes your screen is visible yeah is the slide changing yes yes okay thank you professor rajesh and uh, for the first time i am proudly mentioning nac accredited a double plus so we are very proud about it it's a very recent uh, incident and uh, i am going to have a small talk on metal oxide nano materials for moisture sensing application uh, i have planned this uh, lecture in this conference keeping in view that there may be large number of students who need to first understand what exactly i am doing in my research laboratories because only then they can appreciate the work we are doing so the basic terminologies of what we are doing the basic concept about what we are doing i will be dealing with them first and thereafter i will be coming on to what i have done for a brief period so my half an hour lecture will be simply a combination of initial concepts and thereafter little bit of the actual work done in our laboratory so i am beginning with the metal oxide nano materials for moisture sensing applications so why is there a need for humidity sensor in the simplest way if you want to understand this then many of the industries they make instruments they make food food quality food uh, materials they make various types of uh, things that need a good humidity management and control because we are well aware that a more humid atmosphere degrades materials whether they are bio materials or they are any other material even inorganic materials organic materials they very easily degrade those materials so there is always a need for humidity sensors so that we can monitor we can sense and monitor the humidity level in 
food applica application industries, in manufacturing industries, in any kind of, kind of industries. And not only that, even in our laboratories, we need to manage a level of humidity so that our samples do not get degraded. In our home comfort, also if the humidity is very high, then we feel very, very uncomfortable. The temperature may be around 35, 6 or 37 degrees, but humidity makes us feel like the temperature is 45 degrees centigrade. So in that case, there is a huge need for humidity sensors that can sense and help us monitor and control the humidity levels in different laboratories and industries. But yes, for any sensor to be used widely by the people, society, the industry, the laboratories, the most important factor is the cost. <clears throat> so we have to fabricate, we have to manufacture our sensors in a way that they are very cheaply available. Because if we want to make a sensor and sell it for rupees 100, there is another, another manufacturer who is ready to sell the sensor for rupees 75. So the cost is a very competitive affair when we go for the sensor that we want to sell to the industry, to the laboratories, to the people, to the society. So there is a need for humidity sensor, and the, but the cost of the humidity sensor must be as small as possible. So we have to design our humidity sensor in such a way that we are able to maintain cost and so that it is widely used. Now there is, what is the basic idea of operation of humidity sensor? Now generally, we need for humidity, you see, a hygroscopic material absorbs humidity and the moisture. So naturally, what happens in a hygroscopic material? It is the porosity that counts. So what exactly happened? that uh, whenever humidity or moisture is absorbed or adsorbed by some material, naturally the re resistance of that material will change because of the porosity and the change in the resistance can be manipulated to measure the humidity level at any point of time and thereby control that also. And yes, I'll just be coming a little bit later to, to make the understand the concept of adsorption. So it is the adsorption mechanism on the oxide surface that is helpful in, in, let us say, in understanding the operation of humidity sensors. And there is one, the steel metal oxide, and then you have the doping. If you dope a metal oxide, then you change the morphology of the surface of the material. And once the morphology of the surface of the material is changed, it's sensing characteristic changes. So how we can change, how we can control, the morphology is very, very important. So sometimes the doping is mixed, uh, doping is uh, uh, confused uh, with the mixing. Mixing is a different thing and doping is, at a, is a different thing. In doping, you go through the soft chemical route or something like that and they, these atoms are which are doped are replacing in the interstitial of those materials. So by doping, we change the morphology. We, there is a change in electrical, physical, chemical, optical, and other properties of the metal oxides. And all these changes in different properties can be exploited to be used as a different kinds of sensors. Now mind it, what, what we call as a perturbation in our normal life application is a very good sensor application. For example, if you talk about the fiber of the optical fibers, then when the optical fibers came into existence in the early 80s, then it, it came for the purpose of communication or even a small bending of the op optical fiber as was being avoided because that was, that was going, causing the loss of the information. But later in the early 90s, it was realized that the, these bending of the optical fibers could be exploited for sensing application. And today you can understand how sensors are being made, different kinds of sensors are being made from optical fibers. So what is a general, general deformity in a material is very, very important factor in the humidity sensing application. So in humidity sensing applications, it is the doping that improvises, that improvises the sensitivity, it improvises the reproducibility, it changes the response and recovery times to our advantage. 
Doping may reduce aging. It may reduce the hysteresis behavior of the metal oxides. So doping has a lot of advantages. So we go for sensing by using the metal oxide directly as well as by doping the metal oxide by different noble metals. Now, generally, uh, we mean, what we mean by the metal oxides are the ceramics. But ceramic is a different term also uh, in, the, in, the, in the industrial world also. Where in, uh, the heat treatment is a must for any such material. So we use ceramics for our humidity sensing applications in our laboratory. And what is a ceramic? A ceramic is an inorganic non-metallic solid prepared by action of heat and subsequent cooling. Ceramic materials may have a crystalline or partly crystalline structure or may be amorphous, for example, glass. Because most common ceramics are crystalline, the definition of ceramic is often restricted to generally inorganic crystalline materials as opposed to the non-crystalline glasses. Some ceramics are semiconductors and most of these are transition metal oxides that are 2,4 semiconductors like zinc oxide. Ceramicists are most interested in the electrical properties that show grain boundary effect. And here we will see later, it is the grain boundary effect that helps a lot in sensing application. Now, sem semiconducting ceramics are employed as gas sensors and humidity sensors. When various gases are passed over the polycrystalline ceramic, its electrical resistance changes with tuning to possible gas mixtures, very inexpensive selective devices can be produced for gas sensing. And even and for humidity sensors. Now there is a term that often creeps in whenever we are doing the uh, metal oxide uh, sensors, and they are the composite. Now there, when two when two such materials are mixed together, and they they are able to reside in that material in their separate phases, then it is a composite. And if because of some chemical reaction, either in the solid state reaction or in any other reaction, some different material is formed, it is no more a composite. So one has to be careful in using the word composite or not using the word composite. Many times we use the word nanocomposite and even if when there is a new component formed over there in, the, in between the two materials. So we have to be slightly careful. So one term is composite. We generally use the term annealing in material science and our metal oxides also, while preparing a sensing element, we generally anneal our material, whether it is undoped or doped. So what is annealing? That we also need to understand. Annealing in material science is a heat treatment wherein material is altered, causing changes in its properties such as strength and hardness. Annealing is used to induce ductility. It softens the material, relieves internal stresses, refine the structure by making it homogeneous and improves old working properties. Annealing occurs by diffusion of atoms to the microstructure. Diffusion occurs in any material above absolute zero, but it occurs much faster at higher temperature. So another term that we have is annealing, that is we heat the material to a higher temperature, generally in air, in a furnace, and then we cool it down so that the microstructure of the sensor changes the morphology of the sensor changes and it becomes more sensing. Now mind it, for the students I would like to point out, there is always a confusion among, even among the students. They find some journals called sensors. They find some journals called sensors and actuators. They find some journals called sensors and transducers. So these three terms, sensors, actuators, and transducers, they generally confuse research scholars and uh, postgraduate students also. So let us understand slightly how they are different. One, a sensor, because if we are working on the sensors, we are also using actuators and we may be using transducers also. So what is a sensor? A sensor is a device that detects a physical condition or measures a physical quantity and converts it into a signal which can be read by an observer, right? For example, a mercury in glass thermometer. What happens? It is the height of the mercury in the glass thermometer. That gives the measurement of the temperature. So as here, the sensor is that detects the physical condition. It is the mercury that detects the, the uh, temperature. And the rise in the level of mercury in the tube, that gives the measurement of the temperature. 
similarly a thermocouple a difference of potential between the two ends of the thermocouple gives the measurement of the uh, uh, temperature or whatever you are measuring here so a sensor detects the physical condition or measures a physical condition it measures that and then it converts into a signal which can be read by an observer we can read the change in the length of the mercury level we can read the the temperature directly in a thermocouple by measuring the, by observing the difference in potential between the two ends of the thermocouple the resolution of a sensor is the smallest change it can detect in the quantity that it is measuring now one more thing there generally you will see in literature there is a huge stress and i have been having a lot of debate on this on with uh, different people also that ideal sensors are designed to be linear or linear to some simple mathematical functions of nature typically logarithmic the output signal of such sensor is linearly proportional to the value of simple function of the measure problem but my contention is here that with the growth sharp growth and so much advancement in the electronic industry in electronic circuitry even a non linear or non linear sensor non linear sensing application can be easily made into a very very good sensor so now in the circuitry developed today in the modern world a linearity for a sensor is no more a precondition to be an ideal or a good sensor even a non linear function can give you a very good sensor using the modern application of electronic circuitry and then we have the actuators now sensor that was sensing and converting into a physical quantity that we could measure now actuators are devices like valves and switches unless and until you switch on something your sensor will not work so these valves and switches they are the actuators and they function like turning things on or off and making adjustments in the operational system sensors and actuators may be integrated to create a closed loops operational system between remote locations like retail stores that means your sensor element is there at the remote location and through an actuator here you can sense the it over there so sensors and actuators may also be integrated then we have a transducer you see earlier sensor was very much popular in usa whereas transducer was being used in europe for many years for the same kind of things the word sensor is derived from latin meaning to perceive and transducer is from transducer meaning to lead across a dictionary definition of sensor is a device that detects a change in physical stimulus and turns it into a signal which can be measured or recorded and a corresponding definition of transducer is a device that transfers power from one system to another in the same or in the different mode so this is the sensible distinction i i won't go to in the sensing application like for example gas sensing or humidity sensing it is the van der waals force that become very very important force the van der waal application is very very important application in this arena that we have to take care we have to understand van der waals force we do, i do not be going into details of that but i'll say in brief that the sum of the attractive or repulsive forces between molecules or between part of the same molecules other than those due to covalent bonds or through the electrostatic interaction of ions with one another or with neutral atom these the wide wonder was forces that we generally study at our graduation or post graduation levels but here we need to refine it while we are going into the area that we work in now i will not go into these details then there is a distinction between adsorption and absorption mind you in the gas sensing application or mechanism of gas sensing or moisture sensing it is the word adsorption that is important not absorption you see adsorption is simply the adhesion of the molecule because of such weak forces like van der waals forces on the surface of a substrate so this is adsorption just is sticking there is no chemical reaction involved and when when you when you talk about absorption that is the feeling of the force that is the species diffuse into the volume of the material and they do not remain only on the surface of the material so adsorption is a surface phenomenon and absorption is a volume phenomenon mind it and adsorption that we use may be of two types physics option and chemis option in physics option the energies involved are very very small and that is only physical adsorption they stick to the surface and that can be reversible but in chemi absorption chemis option 
chemical reactions takes place and there can be some chemical bonding involved over there. So we have to distinguish between adsorption because many times people misuse, I mean, they replace the word adsorption for absorption and absorption adsorption for abs absorption. So this is complete definition of adsorption. Right, chemisorption is another one. And a small difference if we have to make, what is physisorption, chemisorption? Physisorption is a general phenomenon and occurs in any solid food or gas system. Chemisorption is characterized by chemical specificity. Perturbation of electronic states will be there, uh, is absent here and it will be there. And energies involved are 10 to 100 milli electron volt. Here the, because actual reactions take place in chemisorption, energies are one to 10 electron volt. So these are the sensible differences between physics option and chemistry option. Now, we will be, I will be explaining a little bit about relative humidity and the, yes, in any sensor, these parameters are very, very important. Whenever we are making a sensor, these parameters are very, very high reliability and long service life, low parameter dependence on temperature, parameter stability in a polluted atmosphere, parameter stability in media, wide operating temperature, high sensitivity, high res short response and recovery time, must be thermally and chemically resistant, should have low hysteresis, must be highly technological and low cost, should be compatible. These are certain parameters of a humidity sensor and not only of humidity sensor, but most of the sensors we make in the industry or in our laboratories, they need to, uh, to, to, to have these parameters in, in the range so that they can be much better operated. Now we define sensitivity like this. That is change in the resistance or impedance per unit change in percentage relative humidity multiplied by 100. We have been using this formula. And of course, you will in the uh, literature, you will also find the uh, ratio, uh, for example, for gases, you will find that uh, the reactance or resistance in air to the resistance in uh, to the reactants in uh, air and in that medium, that ratio is uh, all, all the sensing response. They use the sensing response or even the sensitivity we use. So you will find different definitions of sensitivity, but whatever you are using, that should only be referred to. We have always in our all uh, research papers communicated, use this, our own definition of sensitivity. Now then, next question that my beginning was, why metal oxides for metal moisture sensing? So as we have seen that what parameters are needed for a better sensor, then naturally those parameters become essential ingredients for becoming a good metal oxide moisture sensing material. So chemical and physical stability, it has why metal oxides? Because it has chemical and physical stability, mechanical stability. It manifests grain and grain boundary surfaces. It possesses pores and interconnected voids, which are highly desirable for humidity sensing. Semiconductor oxides gain a special interest due to their good reproducibility, low hysteresis, good response, good, good recovery time, low cost, and humidity sensors in the form of pellet or thin film make. So these are certain parameters that are advantages with, with metal, in the case of metal oxide. So metal oxides are right now finding out a wide application world over for making gas, sensor, gas sensors or humidity sensors. And they offer, of course, cheap also. Now, a lot of research. You will see that I think thousands and thousands of uh, research papers have come up and still the work is going on to optimize the material, to get the best combination or doping of materials so that the sensing is maximum, but there is low aging, there is low hysteresis, there is good response and recovery time. Because if you are having a very good sensitivity in particular material or a combination of material, then there may be response and recovery time is not good. Maybe it has low, it has uh, high aging. It may have high hysteresis. So actually, even after so much of work that have been done, so much literature that have come up, still a lot of research is going on because optimization of the materials to get the best combination of parameters is the key factor. Now, aging in metal oxides, aging is maybe due either to prolonged exposure of surface to high humidity, adsorption of contaminants, preferentially on cation sites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You will have, let us say, hysteresis problem. Metal oxides do have, let us say, 
do have aging problem. They do have hysteresis problem. Absolutely no doubt about it. Now, for example, then let us see, we have in our laboratory done a lot of things, uh, large number of metal oxides for sensing application, for gas sensing applications we have done, we have done for metal oxide, uh, we have done for the moisture sensing also. So one such small result I'm, I'll be discussing about the tungsten oxide and silver doped tungsten oxide prepared through soft chemical route for sensing application of moisture. And you can see from here, what we have done, we have seen the nature of change in LIs because of the doping, because of the annealing, what kind of morphological and crystalline changes have occurred, change in response to humidity, how did they do the change uh, respond to humidity. We have used scanning electron microscope to understand the sur uh, surface morphology, X-ray diffraction has been used to look into the changes in the crystalline structure, etc. So, we have prepared the sample through soft chemical route. I will not go into the details of how we have done it. We have made one to four, we have uh, doped one to four percent of AG in WO3, and then we have annealed it from 400 to 700 degrees centigrade, and then we have made, uh, done the sensing application. So this, this is the principle of operation that we have, that I cannot go into details, how it is adsorbed, WO3 is an N-type semiconductor. In N-type semiconductor, the resistance will decrease. In P-type semiconductor, also we have got, for example, nickel oxide, where the, in, the uh, resistance may increase with increase in humidity. So this is the complete, I mean, mechanism of how AG-loaded WO3 gives you a higher, response, uh, higher sensitivity. That is already published in uh, uh, IEEE sensors and uh, American Journal of uh, Ceramics Technology. So we have, I will not go into the details of that. I'll just show you the humidification graph, how it behaves. Resistance versus relative humidity graph at various annealing temperatures I'm showing here. You can see how in the initial range, you will see of the relative humidity up to around, let us say 40 to 50% relative humidity, the change is very high. That is the, you can say that uh, the sensitivity is very high. So those materials, which give sensitivity very high in, in a particular range of, uh, let us say, humidity, humidity, they can be used in those industries where the humidity levels are in that range. So in different range of relative humidity, we need to prepare different sensing elements so that they can be specifically used in different kinds of industries. One Element, sensing element will not function from zero to 100% with full efficiency or maximum sensitivity. In different range of relative humidity, you need different sensing elements. So this is another humidification graph. And the results are that how the, uh, they will show, you can see annealing temperature, percentage range of relative humidity and sensitivity. Sensitivity of course is increasing with the annealing temperature. And this is for 1% silver doped in AG, in WO3. And this is sensitivity graph. You can see that for 400 to 500, it did not increase, but 600 to 700, the sensitivity did increase when we added 1% of silver. Similarly, if we, if we go, let us see these are all graphs. If we go for one to 4%, this is XRD, I'll just, then we increase the percentage from one to 4% of AG in WO3. Then the results were like this. Maximum sensitivity of 2.38 mega ohm per percent RH was found for sensing element 4% and lowest for no doping. That is, as we went on doping, the sensitivity increased. And this is the mathematical modeling of that, that we got a polynomial of degree three in the relationship between sensitivity and doping percentage. Then hysteresis was well within 2%, acceptable hysteresis for metal oxides in the industry is up to 2 to 5%. We were getting it within 2%. Now aging was also within 2%, which is highly acceptable in the industries today. Now we have done the regression analysis, least square feet we have done, and we have got uh, with respect to polynomial of degree three, and we uh, calculated the polynomials for different, we, these are the polynomial coefficients that we have modeled on the mathematics. Polynomial of coefficient, degree five. Response recovery times were well within control. And as we went on increasing percentage of AG, 
the response time decreased the recovery time decreased that means loading a noble metal in wo3 was increasing the sensitivity decreasing the uh, you can say aging it was decreasing the hysteresis and these are the same graphs you can see crystallization is showing more and more as we are increasing the percentage of ag in wo3 you can see this is for 3% and this is for 4% these are the same studies we have I, I know that there is time restriction. I won't go into the details. These are the conclusions we have. A regression analysis of the data on humidification and desiccation graph gives a least square fit with respect to a polynomial of third degree and fifth degree, indicating a strong correlation between relative percentage, uh, relative humidity, and resistance. And a polynomial of third degree fitted to the curve of sensitivity versus dopant percent. Now we have made a comparison with various publications of other authors and our own. You can see from here sensitivity. For them was in this range kilo ohm per percentage RH, right? and we are getting sensitivity in the range of mega ohm. They have got only kilo ohm. So many uh, comparison with large number of papers in literature we have done, and we have seen that our sensitivity to solid state reaction is much more high. And these are certain publications along the same. So thank you very much. I won't take much time because Rajesh must be thinking that how if our head finishes faster. It is better. Okay, thank you, Professor Pandey. Uh, this is a very nice talk and very fundamental to understand all participants. If they are start on doing research on humidity sensing as a, and developed a sensor, so they can follow all your uh, given topics. Yes. Yes. That was the purpose that yes. if people understand the basic concepts, then they can understand the result. Otherwise, they will not be able to understand the result. That is the basic idea. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so if I, you have any question, I am ready. Or otherwise, I am available in the department also anytime. Yes, yes. If uh, any participants have a question, I think there is no question. <laughs> So I again thanks Professor Pandey. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and sir, now, you kept sir, you kept on saying he is director IPPR, is director activities, so and so, sir. I was. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Presently, I'm only the head of the department of physics, yes. and that's final. <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I have tried to give the basic concept of uh, how the sensing application works. And if students are interested, they can discuss with me later what we have done so I can explain everything to them. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, Professor Pante. Now the third speaker is Dr. Kamakya Prakash Mishra. He is present or not? Present or not? Yes. Hello? Yes, okay. okay. Yes, sir, I am present. I am okay. here only. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kamakya Prakash Mishra obtained his PhD from the University of Lucknow and currently serving as an assistant professor at Manipal University, Jaipur. His area of research is band gap engineering in white band gap semiconductor materials like zinc oxide and titanium oxide. He has published more than 55 research articles in various international journals. He has edited a book on ceramic and engineering published by Elsevier. And engineering published by Elsevier. Three book chapters Three are book chapters are his credit. credit. I think there is a there is a eco eco. Uh, his current research interest uh, his current research interest. Temperature dependent luminescence in rare earth dope, geteno, and polymer imbedded piezoelectric for energy harvesting. He is currently guiding four recently guiding for their PhD. Apart from science, he has been and he has published a one book. 
published in one book. The topic of uh, topic of uh, significance of micro strain in case of packing band gap and photoluminescence of soil gel derived rare earth dope jeteno nano structure. Now I request uh, Professor Kamakya Prakash Mishra. Hello. Yes. Am yes. I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. So, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. So, first of all, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for uh, such kind and nice introduction. So, before I start my presentation, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers, Dr. particularly Dr. Shushil Kumar Singh and Professor R.K. Shukla for giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic of significance of micro strain in impacting band gap and photoluminescence of sol gel derived RE doped ZNO nanostructures. So I belong to a university located in Rajasthan uh, in the heart city of Jaipur. And uh, it is Manipal University, Jaipur. So before I go to the actual pre presentation, I would like to show some uh, pictures of beautiful campus of Manipal University, Jaipur. It is probably coming in the top 10 uh, beautiful campuses of India. So whenever uh, any of the participants, uh, you get a chance to visit Jaipur, do visit my university. I'll be happy to be a good host for you. So here, one caution I would like to put, uh, I am going to use a term, even though the previous talk was also having connect, connection with uh, this term doping. So it's a misleading term. Many times it is not considered in good sense, uh, doping in sports. So there it is considered to be a uh, prohibited term and uh, it's prohibited. So here, uh, also, I'm going to use the same term in connection to semiconductor physics. So in sports, when some kind of band product is utilized to enhance the performance, so that, that is another domain. In semiconductors, doping is a very positive term, and it is intentional introduction of impurities into an intrinsic semiconductor. In fact, because of doping only, we are having today's the whole world of electronics. So in a sense, doping in semiconductors is running a very big industry, a world-class technology. Yes, on the other side, it is banned, particularly in athletics. So uh, now coming to the actual topic, uh, it is the significance of micro strain in impacting the band gap and photoluminescence of RE doped sol gel derived ZNO nanostructures. So RE here stands for rare earth elements. So it's a group of elements. They are rarely or scarcely available in earth crust. So we'll come to that part in the next section before, uh, I mean, at, at first, I would like to talk about uh, uh, the, the host material, that is zinc oxide. So zinc oxide is, a, in a sense, it is a notorious material. Nowadays, many people, uh, they, they do not like this material, even though it is serving a lot in the field of semiconductor physics, even today. So zinc oxide, uh, it belongs to the group second six category of multifunctional semiconductor, and it is the richest family of nanostructures. Numerous kinds of nanostructures uh, based on zinc oxide have been reported in literature. And it is uh, it crystallizes particularly in hexagonal oxide structure at room temperature, though it can crystallize in other structures also like zinc blend and rock salt. They are not stable structures. And uh, hexagonal oxide structure is most commonly referred or most commonly used uh, zinc oxide structure. It is an N-type semiconductor and its band gap is 3.37 electron volt at room temperature. And it has also a high exciton binding energy. Particularly it is compared with gallium nitride, which is also a very good semiconductor material. 
So gallium nitride has uh, some advantage that its counterpart P-type is also available, but zinc oxide has that still uh, a, a debatable uh, P-type semiconductivity, uh, which is which is not stable at room temperature. So it's still uh, being explored in different ways. So 60 uh, million, uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's wrongly written here. It should be small m, so milli electron volt. So, and it is a biocompatible or a very benign material. So that is why people are trying hard to extract some information, some useful information out of zinc oxide. And it has potential applications in multiple fields because of diverse morphology or because of diverse other features. And being a wide band gap semiconductor, it also offers the, the, the possibility of tuning its band gap. So that is uh, typically called as band gap engineering in zinc oxide uh, material. And uh, it, is, uh, it can also be produced by several cost-effective methods. That is also one of the special advantages associated to this material. So, uh, and its properties can be hugely impacted either by doping or by changing its uh, surface morphology or uh, various kinds of microstructures or nanostructures. So now coming to particularly rare earth doping, why I chose rare earth elements as dopants, even though in zinc oxide, I think uh, almost every stable element has been used as dopant and uh, some report you can find in literature on every element getting doped into zinc oxide. So that, that's the say uh, uh, extent of exploration on zinc oxide, which has been done or which is still going on. So rare earth uh, ions, uh, they are uh, uh, generally uh, having one special property associated to them that their uh, 4F orbitals are empty or partially filled. So because of that, the possibility of multiple transitions within them arises and those transitions can give visible emission. Visible emission is highly associated to rare earth elements. So that's why it is anticipated that if they are available within the matrix of zinc oxide, then we can have the visible emission out of zinc oxide material. That is what uh, is, is being expected and anticipated out of zinc oxide nanostructures. It's the similar situation, just like your ruby laser. So in ruby laser, when aluminum oxide matrix is doped with chromium ions, so chromium ions, those transitions, they help in such a way that we can get the visible light emission. So exactly analogical anticipation is being seen when we start doping zinc oxide with RE or rare earth elements. So uh, because of this reason, uh, because of uh, having a quest to achieve visible emission out of zinc oxide by doping RE elements. So this study has been carried out. I mean, this study means whatever results I'm going to show in this presentation. So rare earth elements, I mean, uh, I have chosen two particular rare earth elements. One is cerium, another one is europium. So cerium, I think uh, if we look at all rare earth elements, so cerium is the most ab abundant among them all. I'm not saying abundant amongst all elements. If we particularly take rare earth elements, then we will find that cerium is abundantly available amongst all the rare earth elements. And one more reason, the cerium compound, particularly I try to utilize the chloride or acetate of any material, I will be coming to the method of preparation. So that time I'll be explaining what kind of materials are utilized in preparing doped zinc oxide, particularly in our lab, in my lab. So coming to the point that cerium Chloride is available at very small cost. So that cost factor also plays a crucial role in the choice of the rare earth uh, element. Europium I have chosen as a second 
element, rare earth element for doping into zinc oxide. So europium is not very uh, cheap material because it has the special ability to emit particularly in red region. So zinc oxide inherently has the capability to emit the ultraviolet region. That is one extreme. And if we look at the transitions of European, they have the capability to emit in the region of red. So that is the another extremity of the visible region. So that is the rationale behind the choice of europium as a dopant in zinc oxide. We expect, I mean, I, I particularly, while choosing this material, was anticipating that europium can provide the emission from zinc oxide or being available within zinc oxide uh, in the another extremity of the visible region. So these two logics were there in our mind while beginning the exploration on the dope systems of these materials. Here, uh, the discussion is more focused on uh, uh, significance of micro strains. So I'll be showing the results which are particularly associated to the micro strains, micro strain available within the zinc oxide system. So I would like to spend some time on micro strain also. Whenever some foreign element is going to enter the host material like zinc oxide, so naturally atomic planes or interatomic spacing that would be affected. So that interatomic spacing or interplanar spacing, if it is getting affected, or nearest neighbors or neighboring atoms are getting affected, so there will be some change in some parameter, particularly physical parameter. I was talking about the uh, interplanar spacing. So that change divided by the original value, that actually is called as strain. That gives the sense of strain. So when we are doping a host material by some foreign element, so it's very natural that some element of micro strain would be available within those systems. So those, uh, how that micro strain is correlated with various optical parameters, that is the summary or say precise idea of this particular talk. So zinc oxide, uh, I have chosen uh, cerium and europium in this particular talk. What kind of changes happen in optical properties by uh, doping zinc oxide with these two elements? So here we can notice that zinc oxide, its uh, main uh, host materials, main elements, or, or the first element is zinc. Its ionic radius is 74 picometer, and europium has 90 picometer. So europium is having larger ionic radius. So if it is going to replace zinc within the zinc oxide matrix, so naturally there will be some strain caused within the system. Same is the case with cerium. If we compare ceriums here, it is even larger than zinc, uh, zinc uh, ionic radius. So both of them are having larger. There was uh, uh, pre-material, uh, I, I, I should not say pre-material science era, there was condensed matter physics era where we were bound by some traditional rule. We were looking at the electron affinity, we were looking at the ionic radii, and then we were doping the element within the system. If you can uh, recall the era when of initial initial era of uh, semiconductor physics, so we were very particular. Only silicon or germanium can be doped by so and so or such and such elements. Then they can be converted either p type or so. Those were the traditional rules. With the rise of material science in last two decades, uh, those boundaries have been broken. Now even I, I can say that uh, if we we go back, 20, we go 20 years back, people were not having any any idea of doping cerium because it's having very large ionic radius. So people would not have believed that cerium can be doped or it can settle within the matrix of zinc oxide. But now you can find numerous papers and they are giving significant results when zinc oxide is do getting doped with such element which is having so high ionic radius. 
so uh, rare earth elements they are finding lot many applications in wide variety of areas the previous talk was connected to sensors so you know gas sensors ultraviolet uh, sin detectors and detection of various elements heavy elements so they they are very much uh, uh, that that elemental analysis or detection of various heavy elements is very important when it comes to water purification so and they are uh, being used in rubber and paint industry biomedical applications spintronics because rare earth elements having their empty f shell they can give rise to ferromagnetism also they are inherently ferromagnetic in nature and they are of course being used in electronics their electronic properties can be hugely impacted so same zinc oxide is a semiconductor and if it is getting doped with some foreign element so it's natural to look at the semiconductor uh, behavior of Uh, that material so it is finding tremendous applications in various areas it is means re doped zinc oxide system so i particularly utilized uh, a very frugal method uh, within the limited resources uh, how we can perform some quality research so uh, that with that idea i work in my laboratory so it's a sol gel synthesis uh, process which i utilize in 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 our my laboratory uh, for the development of such zinc oxide nano structures so here we begin with uh, some starting compound particularly zinc acetate is most commonly used compound in my lab and uh, it is dissolved in isopropyl alcohol and uh, we choose the same solvent and we pick up some re compound re compound i was talking about cerium so it's cerium chloride and europium chloride is also uh can also be used so we perform uh, we we first prepare the solution of zinc oxide in isopropyl alcohol uh, with certain molarity and same molarity is uh, followed for preparing the re compounds solution in isopropyl or similar alcohol then during magnetic stirring we add the dopant compound now if we add uh, sodium hydroxide uh, then the precipitation happens and that precipitate uh, can be filtered and we can get powder so we can get nano particles or nano powder and that can be further Uh, utilized for next level analysis yes in between process of heat treatment or sintering they are also followed and uh, other side if we add some stabilizer like diethylamine and we age it for certain time particularly longer duration so it's it it becomes a viscous solution almost transparent uh, or a turbid solution kind of thing it can be coated on a suitable substrate and then uh, that substrate uh, particularly i have utilized uh, uh, spin coating method so spin coating a uh, drop is uh, placed on a on a substrate and then that substrate is rotated with very high speed with certain acceleration so i speed can be 4000 or 5000 uh, rounds per minute so with that speed when that substrate rotates so whatever droplet is there that gets dispersed amongst all possible directions and we get a uniform coating so we we follow this process repeatedly to get an appreciable thickness of the film and uh, we can get the thin film out of this process so this was the brief summary of the process which uh, we utilize in our laboratory for the development of various nano structures now uh, in next 15 minutes uh, i'll be showing you some of the results uh, done on results obtained on re doped zinc oxide system so here uh, you can see the x-ray diffraction pattern of cerium doped zinc oxide nano particles and they were obtained by sol gel as uh, co precipitation method so you you can see the variation of the concentration of cerium within zinc oxide system so here uh, you can see the polycrystalline behavior is being depicted by the x ray diffraction pattern so very common pattern nothing new and we can calculate the particle size or crystallite size using the scherer equation the popular scherer equation so uh, the the calculated results are uh, 
uh, are available on, on this screen. So crystallized size calculated along three major peaks, they are shown, you can see, they all are below 100 nanometers. We can say that the powders are nanocrystalline in nature. And uh, then uh, we follow another method to other values. I hope you can see the cursor. So these two values I'm going to talk about uh, in the next section. So uh, the talk is focused on micro strain. So how to calculate this micro strain? So we follow a standard procedure, which is called as Williamson and Hall method or Hall plot. So there we take some data from X-ray diffraction pattern. So angle of diffraction and micro strain available within the system and the average particle size seen from all directions. So uh, they are correlated via this equation. So what we do, we plot the graph. If you look at this equation, beta cos theta on one side and sine theta on the other side. So if we look at, we take beta cos theta and sine theta as two variables. So this is the straight line equation, simple straight line equation. So we plot the curve of beta cos theta and sine theta, and uh, we fit the straight line within uh, the, the, the data obtained from that. And uh, by looking at the slope, if the sine theta is chosen on x axis, then the slope of this line will give the micro strain value and the intercept will provide us the, the value of the crystallite size, average crystallite size, this is the wavelength. So lambda is wavelength of uh, the X-rays used in the system. Here one caution I would like to put that the WH method is not a very foolproof method, even though it is popularly used. And in fact, I will be presenting all the results based on WH method only. But it ignores a certain factors like size distribution. Here it gives only if you compare the particle sizes or crystallite sizes obtained from Scherer equation. So they are uh, connected with a particular crystallographic plane. Like along one crystallographic plane we are getting, and they can be different. If we see the crystallite size along 100 plane, it's having one this value and this value is different. So, and here, if we calculate the crystallite size using the WH method, we are getting only one value. So, because it does not look at the size distribution, it only gives the average value, domain shape. Is there any anisotropy in the microstrain? Anisotropy means if we see the value of microstrain or the nature of strain or stress applied within the system from various directions, it is, is it having the similar behavior or a different behavior from different directions? So that factor is not included. And what is the actual source? It only measures the micro strain. Micro strain can be there because of various reasons. It can be if it is a coated film. So it can be because of the lattice mismatch within between the uh, substrate and uh, the film coated on the given substrate. So because of that difference also micro strain can be there. So there are multiple reasons behind the rise of micro strain. So while Adopting the Williamson Hall plot, it should not be directly taken in quantitative sense. It can be uh, taken as a qualitative parameter to analyze for preliminary ideas. Then some other methods should be used to cross check whether uh, such a strain is available or such a strain is impacting the properties in a proper manner or not. So with this, uh, I, I would like to show the WH plot conducted or carried out for um, the cerium doped system. So here you can see the, the straight line fit has been best fit must be followed. And the results I've already shown in this particular diagram. So how this micro strain is impacting the optical behavior. So other results I'm not going to show here. One particular result I would like to show. So uh, we performed the nonlinear optical studies on this cerium doped zinc oxide system. So nonlinear optical studies means we we allowed a laser beam from ND Yag laser of 10 to 4 angstrom wavelength to fall or to pass through this material. So nonlinear behavior means the harmonics 
of this wavelength or harmonics of the frequency should also be generated. So we notice the generation of second harmonic and third harmonic. And when we analyze the intensity variation, you can see how the second harmonic generation, second harmonics intensity is getting varied with as we increase the fluence of the laser beam. So it is following a certain pattern. So if we look at the intensity, so this is the intensity curve. So it initially goes down for higher doping, it goes to the higher value. And when we correlate it with micro strain, we find that micro strain is following exactly opposite behavior as this intensity of second harmonic generation is going down, so micro strain is getting up, or in a sense, micro strain is getting up because of that. We can say the second harmonic generation intensity is getting lowered. So, this particular specific behavior was peculiar. So, micro strain can govern the nonlinear behavior of that cerium dope GDNO system. So these are the morphological behaviors. We can notice some sand rose or flower-like structures being obtained in uh, cerium, by cerium doping in Jedunu. So that's uh, not the part of this discussion. So coming to the another system, it is cerium doped zinc oxide thin film. So in cerium doped zinc oxide thin film, if we try to connect the micro strain with the obtained results. First of all, I would like to mention that we could develop the monocrystalline thin films of cerium doped zinc oxide by spin coating, which is a very tough task. So we could optimize our parameter in such a way that we obtained the monocrystalline uh, thin films. And here, if we look at the micro strain and the X-ray diffraction peak position, they are found to be correlated. They are following the similar pattern. You can see this is the side micro strain is getting varied and the similar, almost similar pattern is getting followed by the peak position of X-ray diffraction. So here we can say that the X-ray diffraction peaks position is getting impacted by micro strain. So this is not a very new phenomenon. Naturally, when foreign element is getting inside the host material. So the, the peak positions of X-ray diffraction will be shifted and also micro strain would be shifted. But they are following, following the similar pattern that is a special uh, observation. So all these parameters I've already mentioned how they are calculated and here band gap reduction was noticed and uh, band gap was particularly obtained by tau plot. I'm not going into the details of that particular method. One more thing I would like to put uh, in, in this particular slide, I, I'll be spending one or two minutes. Here, this is the photoluminescence spectra of cerium doped zinc oxide system, thin films. So here we can see the intensity variation as cerium dopant is getting inside the material. There's no peak shift. So band gap is not shifting significantly. Even with the tau plot, the band gap shift was very, very small at the second place or third place of uh, decimal place of uh, the band gap value. So peel intensity and micro strain, they are following the reverse behavior, just like in the previous case where Nonlinear behavior or second harmonic uh, was following the reverse behavior with micro strain. So, peel intensity, photoluminescence, and photoluminescence is highly governed by the defect states created within JDNO system. So, defect states they lie within the band gap and transitions occur within that system. So, the micro strain can influence the PL emission intensity. So these are some peculiar uh, morphological structures which we obtained. So just uh, for the demonstration I have included in this uh, slide, you can see some uh, specific structures are being obtained within the given thin films. Now coming to the last system, so European doping. So here also uh, I would like to mention that monocrystalline thin films could be obtained by using spin coating method. It's a very hard task, it's very tough. So here <clears throat> again, we can find not a definite correlation, but yes, uh, a well uh, systematic 
correlation can be seen between the micro stream and the angle of diffraction so x ray diffraction pattern is getting influenced by the micro stream these are the values calculated here again photoluminescence if we see the intensity of photoluminescence is getting governed as micro strain here in european dope system it is not the reverse behavior it is following the similar behavior as dopant is getting increased within the system micro strain is following certain curve exactly similar curve is getting obtained for the photoluminescence intensity so these are the structures morphological structures obtained by european doping within the zeno system so uh, in summary micro strain uh, is found to affect various parameters it can impact crystallite size it can impact the band structure modification thereby causing this substantial impact on transitions happening within the band gap and that is the reason it can impact the Uh, the photoluminescence or band gap of the system so strain engineering uh, uh, there was uh, a term a very popular term which is uh, being utilized or used in literature that is band gap engineering for last uh, two or three or four decades strain engineering is also a term which is playing a crucial role particularly in the design of mechano optical devices mechano optical devices means my micro strain is a mechanical parameter if we can govern some optical parameter with the help of the mechanical parameter like strain if we can control or monitor the strain and thereby if we are able to control the optical features or parameters so it would be a great achievement particularly in the field of micro electro mechanical devices so mechano optical devices can be usually usually impacted by such kind of observations so this is the whole summary of uh, my talk so i would like to express sincere thanks for patient hearing thank you everyone so thank you dr kamakya pramisra your talk thank you sir your talk is very informative and uh, study in detail in detail dr susil i have some dr susil i have down yes 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 you can conclude it please call to next speaker i may i think my voice is not clear yes clear sir right now clear sir it is clear yes yes okay uh, now i the next speaker is uh, uh, dr neha singh uh, she is uh, from uh, department of microbiology pandit jnm medical college raipur chatisgarh uh, she has uh, more than 10 year experience in research and uh, she has uh, more than uh, 16 research publication in national and international reviewed journal and she participate in more than 20 national workshop and conferences she is member of institutional scientific committee uh, of pandit jnm medical college raipur and she is state advisory member of group of the establishment of rt pcr virology lab in chatisgarh state rt pcr is used in corona okay she is master trainer for newly recruited virology staff in virology labs in different medical colleges of chatisgarh this is a very big uh, achievement and she is member of panelist for the recruitment of hr for virology labs in chatisgarh she is live member in many organization she the in the current she is running five research project related to corona so i invite dr neha singh the topic of uh, dr neha singh is setting up rt pcr lab for covid 19 so i invite dr neha singh uh thank you so much sir uh, for your uh, kind words so uh, let me share my screen here okay uh 
uh, sir, the other participant need to close uh, his screen. Actually, I'm not able to share my screen over uh, this. Yes, yes, right, right now visible. So, yes, uh, yes. is my screen visible? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Now you continue, continue. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind word and uh, invitation in this uh, national conference. And it is really uh, an honor uh, to share my uh, views uh, in this platform. So, uh, today I'm going to talk about setting up a molecular RT-PCR laboratory for COVID-19. So, as we all know, like... Uh, uh, in the current scenario of COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, like this has impacted everyone's life and uh, it, is, uh, on, it is highest on global agenda. So during this situation of uh, COVID-19, RT-PCR laboratory played an important role uh, in the direction of tracing, treating and treatment of the individual who got infected from the SARS-CoV-2. And... Uh, uh, during this uh, situation, Government of India also has developed uh, many molecular RT-PCR laboratory and they have hired uh, so many human resources, resources for the proper functioning of these uh, labs. So keeping this thing in uh, mind, uh, I think the strengthening of molecular RT-PCR laboratory is uh, very important not only for the COVID-19 outbreak but also for the early diagnosis of other uh, viral disease uh, in coming future. So, uh, it's uh, not moving. Yeah. So, uh, learning objectives uh, are uh, here. I have given few uh, step and sequence and uh, planning of your RT-PCR laboratory. So, that is pre-planning and then uh, facility design selection, installation of equipment, selection of kits and reagent, and uh, HR staffing. So before setting up your RT-PCR laboratory, these are the few points which you need to consider. So first of all, you need to uh, uh, ensure that what is the workload for your laboratory, like what is the sample size, daily sample size you are getting for the testing. So it may be like 50 or 100 or 1000, maybe 2000. So it depends upon the workload of, on the laboratory. And then again, you need to think about the turnaround time, like uh, what is the expected time uh, within which you have to uh, report your result, maybe 24 hour or 48 hour and then level of training and skill of manpower. So as we all know, like uh, RT-PCR is uh, one of the sensitive uh, technique where uh, we need skilled and uh, trained staff to carry out uh, this experiment in a very efficiently and accurate way. So you will be needing the trained staff also. Cost, yes, we need to think about the costing also, but not at the expense of quality and safety. So quality here means like, uh, we should not compromise with our uh, result. Result should be accurate, then only we can treat the patient very effectively. And safety means, uh, as we all know, like SARS-CoV-2 is highly infectious. So like we need to save ourselves as well as our lab environment also. So uh, uh, the next thing is, what is the available menu for RT-PCR testing? So uh, here we have keep, uh, three plan. One is fully automated closed system. So this is like uh, here only you need to load the sample into the machine. So an advantage of uh, this fully automated closed system is like you will be getting the high throughput. In one go, you can run many of sample and you will be getting the accurate and precise result. And one of the good uh, advantage of fully automated closed system is like uh, with the uh, COVID-19, uh, RT-PCR assay, you can run the other assays also, like for the other viral diseases. And But such kind of uh, like uh, full, fully automated uh, systems are very expensive than the other like open RT-PCR labs or maybe point of care labs. So uh, point second is open RT-PCR labs. So these are not very expensive when you are uh, going to compare with the uh, closed system. So, but here in this case uh, of uh, uh, setup, you will be needing the trained and skilled staff. So, staff should be very efficient 
to work properly they need to know like what all are the safety procedure while working the laboratory uh, to deal with the all infectious agent and also like uh, when you are going to do the rt pcr testing so you don't know where the error are happening so one should be very trained and they should know the troubleshooting part also so the hr which uh, uh, who are uh, working in the rt pcr laboratory they should be aware of troubleshooting uh, uh, things also and the third option is uh, cv nat on uh, true nat so these are the point of care tests so for such kind of setup uh you will be needing the less skill and less training and you'll be getting your result in uh, quicker than the above two setup and uh, these are having low throughput and uh, cost effective also when you are going to compare with the fully automated closed system or uh, with the open rt pcr laboratory so point to consider before action 2 so here in one column uh, uh, the combination of setup is given and in the another the plan you may consider so in this if you are having the uh, low sample size and infrequent workload like uh, 20 to 30 sample in a one day and a very small space in that case you can go for the closed system with the small throughput like cv nat and true nat if you are having the low sample volume and limited staff availability with testing responsibility then also you can go for the closed system uh, with the uh, point of care uh, type of testing and if you are having the moderate volume like 80 to 100 sample in a day with a small space and shared staff suppose that your staff is working in one lab and uh, in working in the bacteriology and virology both in that case also you can go with the closed system with the more channel and if you are having the high volume like the high sample size and less space and less manpower in that case you can go for the fully automated system closed system where uh, only you have to uh, load your sample in the uh, machine and then you will be getting the result okay and then uh, if you are having the high volume means high sample size in a day and adequate uh, space sufficient manpower also then you can plan your testing in 2 to 3 shift and in this case you can go for the open rt pcr uh, lab system with a dedicated room process and uh, all the equipment you need to install in each and every room then uh, a step to plan and implement open rt pcr testing so here i have given few uh, points which are very practical and convenient also uh, by, uh, without wasting the lot of time uh, if you are going to plan uh, open rt pcr laboratory so the first step uh, is like you have to select the rt pcr uh, kit which is approved by icmr or fda and uh, uh, once you have selected your rt pcr kit then you need to get the uh, verification certificate from the manufacturer or supplier and after selection of the rt pcr kit you have to select the uh, rna extraction kit which is compatible with the rt pcr kit and this also should be validated by the manufacturer so what is the advantage advantage is uh, like if you are getting the uh, verification certificate from the supplier so at the lab level you uh, no need to further uh, verify it so th this will reduce your effort and uh, also for the backup plan you need to select the 2 to 3 manufacturer at a time because uh, suppose that if one supplier is uh, like out of stock then in that case uh, you can go for the uh, another uh, supplier also and then uh, after this step you need to order your equipment and the supplies which are required for uh, the rt pcr laboratory and then you need to think about the uh, infrastructure and electricity so while your order is arriving you need to prepare the bsl2 facility so the bsl2 facility where you are going to set up all your reaction you are going to handle your uh, all biological material uh, in that uh, facility and then uh, after getting the equipment you need to install all the equipment and give the proper training suppose that if your existing staff is not have not trained enough to carry out the uh, molecular biology test so you need to uh, give the proper training also to them and you need to uh, draft a standard operating procedure for each and every uh, uh, procedure 
or a step, whatever is needed in the lab. You need to prepare the worksheet, like how to work in a very efficient manner. So after this, you need to perform the validation or verification test by using the known sample. So these known sample you are going to get with the, uh, from the uh, reference laboratory. So uh, you need to perform the validation test. The uh, test of uh, your laboratory should uh, match with the reference uh, laboratory samples. And after that, uh, you need to finalize your SOPs and also your all staff should be trained uh, to follow such a, all the SOPs. And then you need to perform the competency assessment trial. So here you will be getting the unknown sample from the reference laboratory. Okay, so uh, you will not be aware of what all are the result of those samples. Those will be unknown to you. And you need to uh, test in your laboratory. And then if you are performing your RT-PCR testing in an accurate way, that results should uh, match 100% to the uh, unknown sample, which is provided uh, from the reference laboratory. So this is your inter-laboratory comparison. So once your result is confirmed, it is reproduce, uh, reproducible. That, that means you can start with the patient sample. So this is the point you can start uh, doing the uh, RT-PCR samples for the patients. And then facility and accommodation. So as we all know, like uh, designing a RT-PCR uh, laboratory is a very tedious task. It is not very simple and expensive also. So you will be needing here mechanical barrier to prevent the contamination. Like if you are planning your open RT-PCR laboratory, so you will be having the each separate area for the each procedure to prevent the contamination. And each area should uh, be fascinated, fitted with adequate requirement. And then uh, unidirectional workflow should be there in your laboratory. Like uh, it should be start from sample receiving to sample processing, extraction, pre-PCR, and then post-PCR, and then reporting the sample. And then your result will be uploaded into the ICMR portal. So th it should be unidirectional. And then uh, maintenance of air pressure. So as we know, like this is highly infectious disease. So you will be needing the negative pressure room also uh, where you can uh, deal your biological uh, material or the sample uh, to avoid the aerosol or splashes generated to avoid the contamination, which is uh, uh, generated from the aerosol or uh, while processing your sample. And then temperature and humidity control should be there uh, to get the accurate result exhaust ventilation, reliable water supply should be there to wash your hand properly or to take shower, electricity should be there and backup power plan should also be there. Surface and finishes should be very smooth and non-absorbent or non-skid. So all these points you have to keep in the mind while designing of your RT-PCR leverage. And then is it important to have designated rooms? So yes, uh, again, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, highly infectious and it can spread easily from one uh, to another. So uh, to avoid the cross-contamination, it is very important to keep a separate room for the uh, separate, separate procedures. Because once your sample got uh, contaminated, suppose that sample is negative and if it, it got contaminated, then you will be getting the false positive uh, result. So which is very dangerous. Again, your RNA is uh, like uh, very sensitive. It can be degraded by the nucleus enzyme and it is uh, present everywhere. So uh, again, if your RNA is uh, not active, inactive in the sample, so this will lead the false negative result. That is also very hard to recognize while carrying out the RT-PCR reaction. Also while pipetting, uh, while the processing of the sample, the aerosol gen can generate as small as like 10 to the power six amplicon, uh, which can remain uh, suspended into the air and this can contaminate your surface or the walls or the working area. So you have to keep in mind like while, uh, while doing your experimentation or while setting up your uh, uh, RT-PCR experiment uh, uh, so that your area cannot get uh, contaminated uh, with a such kind of activity. So if your laboratory design is not robust, it is very uh, easy to get the wrong result. So that's why what we are doing in case of PCR, we are keep, keeping each area separate. 
so laboratory design for open rt pcr lab like uh, here you will be needing the following physical uh, separate room like room 1 for the sample processing room 2 for the nucleic acid extraction room room 3 reagent preparation which is also called uh, master mix preparation room and then uh, room 4 uh, is template addition room and room 5 is amplification and detection so apart from uh, these room you will be needing the other another area also those are the sample receiving area donning room doffing room staff room a designated uh, consumable store room autoclave room and uh, space for handling the biomedical waste also so one thing you need to keep in mind like uh, these in uh, physical room uh, they each room should have its own equipment and protective clothing and consumable and there should not be any transportation between these room to avoid the cross contamination and uh, this is the basic uh, layout of the bsl2 uh, rt pcr virology laboratory which is uh, approved by government of chatisgarh so uh, and uh, now this is the lab designing of point of care lab so essential requirement for uh, setting up the cb nat or uh, true nat laboratory are as follow like here also you will be needing one sample receiving area and one designated place for uh, keeping your bio safety cabinet for the processing of sample and then one designated area uh, for uh, running your sample in the machine like gene expert instrument or maybe in true nat pcr analyzer and then one designated room you will be needing for the consumable storage and then one documentation or you can say reporting room and one designated area for autoclave and one uh, space for the handling biomedical waste so uh, in case of cv nat or true nat you if like if you are not having very sufficient space then you can uh, set up such kind of laboratory in one single room so and you can do one partition at one place you can keep your bio safety cabinet uh, and uh, for the sample processing and one uh, one place you can uh, run your sample so two physical room are uh, not very mandatory in such kind of setting and bsl2 and uh, bio safety cabinet also not mandatory in case of uh, point of care laboratory then equipment requirement so uh, again uh, like equipment depart, uh, requirement will be it, it will depend upon the type of uh, and level of automation you are going to plan like if it is fully automated then uh, you will be needing the less instrument if you are going for the open rt pcr laboratory then list of instrument will be different so it depends upon your level of automation so again a few basic uh, and mandatory equipment uh, those uh, are like bio safety cabinet class 2 and uh, laminar air flow pcr hood centrifuges if you are going to plan manual extraction or uh, vortex mixer mini centrifuges each room you will be uh, needing and then micro pipette with the barrier tips you will be needing rt pcr instrument you will be uh, needing and it should be compatible if you are going for the open rt pcr lab and then refrigerator for the storage of your chemicals and uh, other uh, kits and then deep freezer uh, for uh, uh, like minus 20 and minus 80 for your storage of sample and also extracted rna an auto clip so once you got uh, received all the equipment you need to ensure the uh, like uh, your all the equipment have been installed properly and they are uh, working properly and you need to get the performance qualification certificate from the manufacturer and this is the responsibility of your lab in charge he need to he or she need to ensure that all the equipments are work, working perfectly and there are uh, no error in these and also you need to get the uh, like uh, qualification certificate and then kits and consumables so as i told you like kit uh, which we are going to use for the rt pcr laboratory those should be approved from the icmr and uh, if uh, some research kit or in house developed kit is there you are going to develop for your research purpose that is not recommended for uh, to carry out the rt pcr test and uh, 
validation report uh, for all the kit like uh, rna extraction kit or it may be rt pcr kit you need to obtain from the manufacturer that is uh, mandatory and performance certificate also you need to have with you and after selection of pcr kit it is always better to choose the rna kit which is compatible with your rt pcr kit and again these rt pcr and rna extraction kit should be compatible with your rt pcr instrument and you have to check the fluorescence channel um, and this will ensure that laboratory is uh, achieving their sensitivity and specificity which is uh, claimed by the manufacturer and then in case uh, if you are going to set up closed system like fully automated closed system in that case the entire supply of the consumable uh, like including vtm swab stick and the license buffer should uh, you need to obtain from the recommended manufacturer only or with the same company otherwise they are not going to work properly you will uh, they are not fit like for the closed system uh, there are uh, like kit and the consumable is uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, supplied by the same manufacturer and the kit should uh, be used only for the sample type of mention like from each kit you will be getting the manual there uh, uh, should be written like oropharyngeal or the nasopharyngeal sample so you should not uh, like test the another kind of uh, sample uh, if they are mentioning some other kind of sample uh, suppose that if you are going to test uh, uh, or use the sample uh, such as a stool then you are not going to get the complete result and even if you want to test the another kind of sample then again you need to contact with the supplier or the company and you need to get the validation certificate from them then only it is going to work and it is always necessary uh, to do uh, verification validation you using at least 20 sample with the different staff so that you can cross check like your result are reproducible then only you need to uh, ensure yes you are uh, doing your experiment or the testing in a right way then verification protocol for the kit so here uh, like uh, you need to keep three thing in the mind like uh, you need to ensure the correlation Co correlation means uh, like all your positive and negative result are uh, uh, accurate and they are getting approximately ct value while uh, doing uh, so many time and then reproducibility like if, if you are running your sample in duplicate and uh, by the each designated staff you should not get the difference uh, uh, more than 0 0.5 in the ct value that means your result are accurate and reproducible and precision means the range of uh, ct value achievable uh, should be achievable by the lab uh, if you are going to repeat it uh, for two to three times with the different staff. So there should not be major uh, change in your CT value. So these thing, uh, three things you need to keep in uh, mind. And then final checklist uh, for your RT-PCR laboratory, you need to ensure that uh, lab facility is ready. Uh, all rooms are ready as per the requirement. All the equipment have been installed and uh, you have uh, checked like they are working uh, correctly all the training of your human resources have been done in a accurate manner and you have all the kits and supply uh, in your uh, uh, store and uh, you need to ensure again like training of person have been done for the rt pcr for the bio safety and uh, for the disinfection protocol and uh, uh, for all the sops and then again, uh, you need to ensure like uh, method verification and uh, uh, you need to ensure the process flow. And then mock drill have been done for the all. And then uh, interlaboratory comparison of the result done with the mentoring laboratory. So here you need to, uh, this is what uh, mentoring laboratory will uh, give you a certificate. So yes, now you are ready uh, for uh, running your lab, RT-PCR lab for the COVID-19. So uh, that means you are, you are uh, able to reproduce your uh, result 100%. So this is what you need to keep ready when you are going to set up RT-PCR leverage. So uh, this is the operational guideline uh, for BSL2 virology laboratory where I worked as a principal contributor, uh, contributor. and uh, this uh, guideline is already approved by government of Chhattisgarh and uh, this will be uh, 
uh, very helpful uh, for giving the training of uh, uh, staff who are already working in the virology lab. And definitely it is a need of R because strengthening is very important because earlier we were not aware of, like most of them were not aware of RT-PCR, what is RT-PCR, how to do this. So with these words, I'll end my presentation here. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Misa Singh. Uh, your uh, talk is uh, relevant to the present scenario uh, for COVID. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, so first of time, uh, I move further uh, to invite next speaker, uh, Dr. S. K. Yadav. He is present or not? Dr. Yadav. Dr. Subhash Kumar Yadav ji. Very yes. good afternoon to all of you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Subhash Kumar Yadav is Associate Professor in Department of Statistics, uh, School of Physical and Decision Sciences, Baba Sao Bhim Rao Ambedkar University, Lucknow. He th uh, taught in uh, PG classes on the topic of interference, sampling, design of experiments, statistical quality control, ecometrics, statistical methods. And uh, he awarded the CSIR UGC in net uh, in year 2005. His Young Research Travel Award uh, in the year of 2014. And uh, he is also awarded the Young Scientist Award 2016 by Venus International Research Foundation, Chennai. And in 2018, uh, he got the Best Paper Award in international conference at Virginia Beach Resort, Virginia. Uh, he uh, has uh, uh, supervised three PhD students and uh, he completed two research projects. And uh, he has uh, more than 50 research paper in national or international conferences. He published uh, uh, two research uh, two books, and he gives uh, more than 30 invited talks in different uh, conferences and seminars. Uh, he presented more than 25 research papers in different conferences. And he has a vast knowledge in uh, statistical modeling. And today, topic of Dr. S.K. Yadav is a different aspect of statistical modeling for the prediction of infectious disease discrimination. So now I request Dr. S.K. Yadoji to please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. So very good afternoon to all of you. As sir has introduced, I am Dr. Sir, your Singh. voice is very low. So you can increase your volume. OK. I think it, it is at high level. So whether I am audible? Yes, yes, yes. Now, oh, okay. So uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so first of all, I must thank to Professor Sukla sir and uh, Dr. Singh for giving me an opportunity to express my view regarding disease modeling here. Uh, so without, uh, I think, wasting time, I should start. So let me share the screen. And we will be discussing uh, different aspects of uh, disease modeling for the infectious diseases. So is this visible uh, to all of you? Is it visible? Please yeah, Yes, 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 it is visible. So, okay, so um, we will be discussing, uh, I mean, basically three types of models uh, for disease mod modeling uh, for the infectious disease uh, and the main emphasis will be on the, uh, this uh, current scenario for the uh, COVID. Sir, your is slow, you pass So, uh, are you, sir? Yes, sir, okay. Okay, sir, okay. 
so we will be discussing i mean different aspects mainly three aspects of uh, the statistical modeling for the prediction of infectious disease dissemination or spread uh, uh, basically we will be considering uh, the uh, taking into consideration the current scenario of covid 19 uh, this uh, the omicron variant so first of all uh, whenever uh, we are talking about uh, disease modeling so the term which comes into our mind is that what is statistical modeling so basically statistical modeling uh, is a functional relationship or establishment of the functional relationship between the dependent and the independent variables and uh, if we talk about the disease modeling so uh, these uh, i mean uh, this relationship between dependent and independent or explanatory variables are established through different differential equations and they, there are the different aspects we will be discussing here so in simple word statistical modeling is a simplified mathematically structured method of approximating reality which is uh, which, which generates the data so there is a very common question in uh, i mean uh, public uh, that uh, whether data generates the model or model generates the data so let me uh, very put the word here and let me clear here that um, model generates the data not data generate, generates the model so wherever we are getting the data it has been generated by some model so that is why we try to model the things uh, the data Uh, and we try to get the model from where it has been generated so potentially and obviously potentially making predictions based on this these approximations yeah this approximation the statistical model is obviously a mathematical uh, model or uh, which involves some differential equations now we should know what is since we are establishing the relationship between dependent and independent variable so we should know which one is independent dependent variable and which one is independent variable so in uh, almost all cases uh, uh, in statistical modeling uh, we know that uh, uh, most of the these two i mean dependent and independent variables are applied here now and we try to establish the relationship between the two and uh, there may be more than one i mean independent variable as well so the dependent variable is one we want to explain it or to predict it an explanatory variable is the variable which we use in the explanation of the main variable or uh, study variable or say uh, dependent variable or primary variable there are so many names of the both the two variables very dependent and independent so explanatory variables also referred as independent variables are the uh, variables which are used to explain the dependent variable now what are the model parameters because we are using uh, different models to describe the uh, i mean spread of the um, disease the infectious disease under consideration so it involves some uh, apart from these i mean variables involved in the model there are some other constants are uh, which are known as parameters so in classic parameter model parametric model the dependent variable is linked to explanatory variable or independent variable through some constants and these quantities are known as the uh, models of the parameter uh, the these are known, the, known as the parameters of the model under consideration so for example if we are considering a simple line y is equal to a plus bx so y is linked with a x here y dependent variable is y and independent is x and y is linked with x through the two constants say a plus b a and b so here a and b are the parameters of this model uh, which is line here y equal to a plus b similarly we can have different um, linear as well as non linear models Uh, for the explanation and prediction of the uh, phenomena under consideration so now what is a model residual what is model error so technically model residual or error are the distances or differences so this is the difference between the observed value and the predicted or expected value of the dependent variable so here you can see here this is the observed value and this this will be the expected value or that is why we have put it 
through a model equal, equivalent to each other y is equal to a plus bx so we have model y through x by a plus bx and y will have some its original observed observations and on the basis of x we can model it so the difference between the two that is y minus a minus bx will be the error so this is the difference between the object and the expected uh, value of the dependent variable now what is the goodness of it so we we can fit just like this line we can fit different models and we choose the model on the basis of the error between the two so uh, the we wish that to choose that model which has the minimum or least residual sum of square or error sum of square because we we don't take error as a major here we take the sum of square of the error because the sum uh, the property uh, of the mean that sum of uh, deviation about mean is zero the, so that is if you will add uh, this uh, all the errors it will be zero because we know that this error follow the normal distribution with zero mean and fixed variance sigma square so uh, the sum will be zero so what we do we, we square these errors and we sum up these errors and the sum is known as the residual sum of square or sometimes we call it as error sum of square and we try to reduce it so the model will be known as the best fitted model which has the least residual sum of square it means if the difference between observed and the expected of the, uh, value of the dependent variable is very very close to each other we wish that it should be zero because we we want to predict why whatever uh, is the reality but uh, uh, since we know we don't know the model so we try to fit the best model so we search for the model best fitted model and the best fitted model will be that uh, which minimizes the error are residual between uh, object and expected point of the model under consideration so there are so many majors to measure this goodness of fit and uh, uh, one of the very famous major is the i mean uh, coefficient of determination r square r square coefficient of determination but the restriction is that coefficient this is the i mean very good model uh, major very good major goodness of fit major for uh, measuring the goodness of fit of the model but only for the linear models but if you are dealing with the non linear models then this le leads to some mis uh, interpretation so there we use the residual sum of square so residual sum of square or error sum of square is a fitting measure which is applicable to both linear as well as non linear models and there are so many other um, models uh, measures fitting measures which are known as fitting fitting measures uh, which measures the goodness of fit uh, and uh, some of them uh, are uh, uh, aic bic mae aic ek ek information criteria bic bayesian information criteria and mae mean absolute error and rmse so, so there are so many measures of goodness of fit so we will be discussing uh, in different aspects of uh, this digit modeling so now what is infectious disease modeling actually and which we we will be discussing in different aspects of this i mean disease modeling so the infectious disease modeling is a tool that has used to study the mechanism by which disease spread or disease dissemination to predict the future course of an outbreak and to evaluate a strategy to control an epidemic so this we do uh, under the umbrella of this uh, infectious disease modeling so we try to model these uh, on the basis of different variables and the parameters uh, and we uh, try to estimate uh, uh, some very famous i mean measures on the basis of uh, which we can uh, i mean break this uh, the dissemination for the dissemination of this uh, infectious disease and we can um, uh, make some robust policies uh, to break this chain so now uh, the now we come to the main point uh, so that how many um, i mean aspects of this disease modeling we are going to discuss so what are different types of infectious disease modeling so there are uh, basically we will be discussing three main i mean um, aspects of infectious disease modeling and uh, these methods are known as the first one is distribution fitting method 
and the another one is time series regression model since uh, this uh, i mean phenomena is developing over time so uh, time series modeling time series regression modeling will be applied there uh, to predict and uh, explain and predict this phenomena and obviously one of the most important uh, modeling disease modeling method is the epidemiological method or it is also known as compartmental modeling so now what we do in distribution fitting so we know there are uh, basically i mean uh, two types of uh, method uh, distributions uh, discrete distributions and continuous distributions and further uh, we have some i mean parametric distribution and some non parametric distributions as well so and uh, so in among these i mean theoretical distributions discrete as well as continuous we have some symmetric distribution and we have some skewed or asymmetric distributions and so uh, looking into the nature of the disease we have fitted i mean 123 discrete continuous parametric and non parametric distributions uh, for uh, the different cases of this infectious disease for the we have fitted it for the confirmed cases we have fitted it for the um, recovered cases we have fitted it for the infected cases so uh, for different uh, types of cases we have fitted different distributions and we have seen we have taken uh, data over the world Uh, and we have chosen uh, top twelve countries having, uh, I mean, sufficient data to uh, apply this statistical analysis. And uh, we have applied these three aspects. Uh, one of them is this one, I mean, distribution fitting. And we have uh, fitted one twenty three different distributions over, uh, say, confirmed cases and uh, required and uh, infectious cases as well. And we have found uh, on the basis of the goodness of fit of distribution. we have checked it through the chi square goodness of fit test so we have checked and we have um, observed that uh, different distributions are uh, best fit distribution for different countries under consideration uh, for the um, i mean this um, infectious disease covid 19 dissemination so here there are graph for different uh, countries we have considered 12 top countries Top twelve countries of the world for the Omicron variant. We have taken data and uh, then we have fitted for uh, say confirmed cases. So these are different distributions. You can say here uh, the, the the best fitted distribution is different for different uh, countries under consideration. Twelve countries. So here uh, we can make uh, picture more clear that uh, these are the countries uh, which uh, we considered into consideration for the analysis. Twelve top twelve countries: Afghanistan. Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, India, Japan, Mexico, Pakistan, Philippines, South Africa, South Korea, and Thailand. And you can see here uh, from this table, uh, we can observe that these are the best fitted distributions. Here, uh, in case of Afghanistan, the best fitted uh, theoretical distribution is the Gauss hyper distribution. and uh, for austria it is las laplace asymmetric laplace there are symmetric laplace as well double exponential it is also known as double exponential and it is asymmetric laplace and uh, again uh, for belgium it is hypergeometric so you can we can observe here uh, the um, there are similar trend similar best fitted distribution for afghanistan as well as for, for belgium and uh, gen half uh, logistic you can see here for czech republic and it is uh, moel for india and uh, gen extreme it is for japan and uh, again gen half logistic uh, for mexico as it was for the czech republic and you can say nagasaki nagagami distribution is for the pakistan it is best fitted distribution and uh, d gamma is for philippines and beta you can see here observe for south africa as well as for south korea the best fitted distribution is beta and uh, triangular is for the thailand and uh, these are some i mean parameters basically location parameter and scale parameters are given here uh, mean and uh, how many uh, i mean average persons are uh, confirmed for covid 19 uh, for the omicron variant and uh, uh, what is the expert, uh, i mean variations uh, among these diagnoses so these are the variants uh, these are the variants for the respective countries with a mean of the confirmed 
now we come to the second aspect of uh, disease modeling which is time series regression modeling since covid 19 infectious disease is developing over time that is why it must be analyzed and predicted through the best fitted time series model so there are uh, different types of time series models as well we will be discussing and uh, there are two methodologies basically arima and uh, exponential smoothing methods so we will be applying both the methods and will be getting uh, the best fitted time series model for the 12 countries under consideration so to find the best fitted time series models for the consideration all 12 countries we have used two methods one the well known exponential smoothing method for which different models namely simple linear trend holtz linear trend brown's linear trend and damped linear trend have been applied so there are four methods under exponential smoothing which has been applied for the uh, to get the best fitted time series distribution time time series model and the second one is uh, well known arima model that is auto regressive integrated moving average method which is a composition of ar model that is auto regressive model and the integration which is used to make the uh, series stationary we'll be discussing later and the ma that, that is moving average model so we will discuss below the arima model for the time series now what is stationary time series if we are getting the data in chronological order this data is known as time series data or time series so if the location and the scale parameters along with the covariance if the mean variance and covariance for the series are same for different time points then such type of time series is known as stationary if it is not so then we take the differences in between the values of the different time points to make it stationary and this process is um, known as integration we take the differences among the observations of the time series and we make it stationary this is also known as smoothing method so uh, we make it stationary and uh, when it, it it is stationary then we apply different um, models and through that we get the uh, i mean estimates of the parameters as uh, best linear bias parameters uh, otherwise uh, the these uh, i mean parameters will not be good um, they will be biased Uh, if uh, stationarity is not there so stationarity is must to make the predictions through the time series and to make the non stationary time series stationary we take the differences and this method is known as uh, i mean um, integration so there are um, four type of model we will be discussing ar model ma model and the fusion of the two that is arma and uh, the next one arima integration is applied there when the time series is not stationary if it is stationary then uh, arma is sufficient so what is auto regressive here you can say here the auto regressive model is this one y is equal to theta 1 y t minus 1 plus theta 2 y t minus 2 and so on theta p plus y t minus p it means in such type of model we take the lagged values of the main variable under consideration now the question arises arises how many lagged values should be included into the model if we are considering ar why only p so this is decided through the auto correlation function and partial auto correlation function these Graph, the graph between the correlation function and the partial auto correlation function give the optimum value of the lagged values of the variable under consideration, and it is used for the ARM, AR model as well as for the ARM model, uh, AM model that is moving average. So what will what is the need of uh, I mean moving average? So sometimes we if we consider the differences, so after differences are the I mean. Uh, handled by this ar auto regressive model but there are some unobserved changes some unobserved variations in the series which are not being observed by the um, this ar model so uh, and we put them into the series. so as we model the error 
So just like here, you can see, just I like uh, here, we have taken the lagged values of the dependent variable. There, we take the lagged values of the errors to manage the to predict the I mean unobserved variations in the signals. So that is known as moving average or MA moving average model. So here you can see here we are just taking y2 is equal to phi naught epsilon t plus phi naught epsilon t minus 1 and so here we are taking the lagged values of the error under consideration error of the model that is which is also known as residual of the model. So I am not going into the um, deep mathematics of this. So we take uh, so sometimes if, uh, unobserved uh, I mean variations are there so we can use this MA model. And if there are, uh, I mean, object and um, object models variations are there in the time series and we are uh, not uh, in position to, um, I mean, use uh, to select which uh, AR or MA model should we use. So we use both type of uh, variation, uh, consider, considering both type of variations. So we take the fusion of the two, uh, mixture of the two uh, methods, AR and MA, and this is known as ARMA auto rope regressive along with the moving average models which is known as arma so uh, now the model uh, we have just taken here you can see uh, from this uh, mathematical model that why we have taken the ar part as well as the ma part now the question arises how we will decide the values of p and q how many lagged values should be taken for the dependent variable and how many val uh, lagged values should be taken for the error. So uh, we have discussed already that uh, this is decided through the ACF and PACF and uh, there we get the optimum values of P and Q and then we apply uh, this ARMA model. Now this ARMA is good in prediction if the time series under consideration is stationary. But in case of this, I mean uh, COVID or uh, say infectious disease dissemination, it is um, not possible that the series will be stationary. So we have to make it stationary and we take integration and then we use the ARIMA model. So there is very famous, I mean, uh, very well known box Jenkins method uh, will be applied to uh, apply these models. So here we have used uh, that uh, ACF autocorrelation function and PACF is used uh, to get the optimum values of P and Q uh, under consideration for AR and MA. So now we come to autoregressive integrated moving average model that is ARIMA model. The autoregressive integrated moving average that is ARIMA model suggested by Box et al. in 1994 is a generalization of ARMA model, autoregressive moving average with non-stationary time series. So our image non-stationary means that it has non-constant mean and variance. So time to time mean and variance will vary. And we should know to make it stationary if the, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, dissemination of the infectious disease is stationary. So the mean and variance and covariance should be constant for different time points. If it is not so, then we make it stationary and then we get the model parameters estimated. So, okay, the integrated part refers to a differencing initial step, which can be applied to eliminate the non-stationarity of the time series under consideration. So, some application of this method uh, to epidemiological time series may be due to these, these uh, authors have used different, uh, I mean, ARIMA for uh, prediction of different um, epidemiological uh, data. So here AR, integration and moving average. So AR model is the model which represents a variable that regress on its lagged or prior variable. Dependent variable considers its own lagged values. Integration shows the differencing of basic observations so that the time series may be stationary. And the moving average provides the dosality between the observation and the residual. Observation means y and the residual error 
E from the AMA model for the lag observation because this time series data is mostly auto correlated. So this is this. These are some mathematics. We are not going into the detail of this mathematics. And if anyone is interested, then we can uh, discuss later. So these are some mathematics. Uh, and the 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 another one is also if seasonal term is also added uh, there in the uh, Arima model. So it is known as Arima. So Arima is nothing but seasonal Arima, and is suitable for the time series uh, with seasonality. So season seasonal auto correlation. Uh, auto regressive integrated moving average that is arima or seasonal arima is an extensive extended version of arima for the seasonal uh, variations representing a univariate series with a new seasonal component so it is applied there uh, just we will uh, use it just like arima uh, with the seasonal term one more seasonal term. so now uh, as we have discussed there is a very famous uh, box jenkin methodology uh, for the analysis and prediction of time series models so there are three parts of this uh, i mean box jenkin methodology one is identification second one is estimation and the third one is diagnostic checking so definitely identification uh, through scatter plot auto correlation partial auto correlation and other knowledge then a family of Ingenious Arima model has opted an estimation of P, D, and Q is there. So that is identification means we estimate the optimum values of P, D, and Q under consideration for the Arima model taken for the analysis of the infectious disease under consideration. Now the estimation means estimation of the parameters of the uh, time series model. So the model parameters phi and theta generally, which we have written uh, phi for the um, MA model and theta for the uh, AR model. So arima it means the fusion of the theta and phi. Consideration are estimated through the well-known maximum likelihood method, that is MLE, uh, back casting, and other as discussed by Jenkins Jenkin, box Jenkins in 1976 when they. Given this, I mean, box thinking methodology. So now, diagnostic checking we know the best fitted uh, time series to know, to know the uh, best fitted time series, we go for the diagnostic checking. So, uh, the adequacy of the fitted model is checked through auto correlations of the residuals or error values. And uh, we have discussed different, uh, I mean, aspect R square, S square, MAE, AIC, BIC. Different uh, checking or uh, fitting measures are there to check the diagnostic checking of this uh, uh, ARIMA model under consideration. So these are, uh, I mean, uh, best fitted time series models uh, for uh, top 12 countries under consideration. And uh, these dotted points are showing the further prediction of uh, for uh, next 15 days. So here you can see here uh, uh, from this table, it is very clear that uh, which uh, time series model is best fitted for uh, different countries. Oh, sorry, sir, uh, for interrupting. Uh, sir, please conclude such me. Okay, okay. So this is, uh, I mean, uh, very yes, in, in five minutes, we will be. Yes, yes. Uh, the time has allotted, sir, for others, sir. Okay, okay. So, That's so right. here you can see here uh, most of the countries uh, it is uh, Arima best fitted model for different countries and Brown is so Arima and Brown are uh, best fitted model for different countries except this HALT is uh, I'm best fitted time series model for the Afghanistan. So you can hear these are the different diagnostic measures R square, RMSC, uh, MAP, MAE, uh, NBIC. So on the basis of these we can get different uh, best fitted models. Now we come to compartmental modeling. So there are different, uh, I mean, uh, compartmental models. Uh, and here you can see here, uh, this is the uh, type of pathogen that is virus agent, uh, virus, bacteria, protozoa, and uh, helminths. So we will be discussing uh, here for the virus only. And uh, you can see here uh, under different, uh, how it is spread from uh, different creatures to creatures. So now we come to, there is a very crucial, I mean, major, which is known as basic reproduction number. 
and it uh, tells uh, how an infected person uh, infect on average how many persons uh, are infected through uh, one infected person so this is very crucial and we have just calculated uh, we have applied i mean sr sir model which is known as susceptible infected and uh, recovered so there are so many models here you can see si model that is susceptible and infected and uh, with uh, si so you can see here susceptible and infectious and then sis that is susceptible infectious and again it is susceptible so now sir model which we have used uh, that is susceptible infectious and recovered and uh, we have fitted sir model for different trial countries and uh, here from this table you can see uh, these are the population of different countries and these are the dates uh, start date and end date uh, for the data collection so we have uh, most of the countries for most of the country we have taken data for 58 days and some of them for 57 days and uh, these are the um, i mean uh, this is known as rate of infection and this is known as a recovery rate or rate, rate of recovery and the ratio of the two is known as basic reproduction number beta upon gamma so you can here we can observe that most of the countries if this are we apply different suppressive measures if this r is r not is greater than 1 it means the disease is prevailing if this is less less than one then it means the uh, this uh, disease is coming down so you can see here for the omicron uh, variant uh, it is very high for the india you can see here it is 2.3 it means on average one infected person is infecting 2.3 persons and uh, for rest of the countries it is almost one and uh, except this one i mean belgium it is 1.2 so here uh, you can keeping in mind the this number we can make some robust policies to apply the pharmaceutical or non pharmaceutical interventions pharmaceuticals means vaccination and others treatment uh, hospital infrastructure and non pharmaceutical means uh, uh, mask wearing making distance and hand sanitization and uh, lockdown and these are the non pharmaceutical uh, interventions or say suppressive measures to Uh, make this uh, infectious disease down so this was uh, these were three aspects of i mean uh, disease modeling uh, if you have any query then you quickly you ask otherwise we are running late so thank you for patiently looking uh, listening me and thank you once again for the organizers to organizers for giving me opportunity to i mean express my view uh, regarding the statistical disease model sir sir i have one query Okay. So you have used NBIC, NBIC measures. So yeah, sir, normalized Bayesian information criteria. So we can use the AIC, BIC definitely, also. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah so but so here uh, you you can use any of the parameters R square, yeah. square MAE, AIC, BIC. Just, yeah. Okay. Just, just to show we have taken here, we have not taken. Yeah. And 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 see, ma'am, all are the functions of residual. So yeah, yeah. Also function of residual, MI, MAE is also function, and BIC mm -hmm. is also function of residual. So you can make different, uh, I mean, fitting measures. You can use. It. Yeah, and also that sir, serima. So serima, can we use that means what? That can we use yearly data? You cannot means uh, serima is a seasonal serima model. So that means what? If you have, if we have the price data, daily price data, monthly price data. Uh, use yeah. But but uh, for the yearly data production, suppose production of any agricultural crop, so can we use a serima? Serima is, uh, I mean, not very suitable for uh, the over the year. Uh, if if the I mean. Season is same. Uh, sometimes, if the product is, I mean, having uh, same sale type uh, for over the year, then you can use that. Otherwise, Arima is good. Yeah. So actually, sir, do we have any idea that means how many number of observation, minimum number of observation for fitting the Arima model? actually if we, we are dealing with the i mean uh, this uh, parametric models we, we are using the um, estimation methods mle so actually so uh, yeah. it is said that uh, there should be at least six observations six observation six and more okay so that six if uh, we have six observations so then, then training we can apply parametric test there 
otherwise we are bound to use non permitting test there yeah okay only such six observations six and uh, means there should not be less than six okay okay sir thank you sir thank you sir for uh, nice presentations uh, delivered by you and uh, for any questions uh, the partic participant you can mail to sir definitely sir uh, now we are going to invite the uh, dr nishant uh, he will chair the next session in place of professor rk sukla sir so professor rk sukla sir please over to you the chair to dr nishant dr nishant yes sir dr nishant you can continue and uh, in so this unmute your mic dr nishant yes. thank you sir now there is a uh, uh, oral presentation session and the first speaker is mr borsa niyog mrs borsa yes, niyog yes i am here yes sir i am here please share your screen and tell something and please give a brief introduction and then start your talk okay is it visible sir Yes, sir. Please go to PPT mode, presentation mode. Yes. Good afternoon to all of you. I am Barsha Neo, assistant professor from Department of Agricultural Statistics from Assam Agricultural University. So, um, respected chairman, sir, and all the participants present here, today I am going to present on my research. Uh, topic on statistical assessment of trend analysis on area production and yield of major crops of assam so that uh, as we know that agriculture sector contributes generally to the output and employment of a predominantly agricultural based and overpopulated country like india the same way to assam is also an agriculturally based state so then economy and livelihood of assam are mainly based on agriculture and it more than 50% population depends on agriculture for their livelihood so yield and growth of agriculture we have seen that yield and growth of agricultural crops and indices of agriculture that in assam is comparatively lower than the national average so that means what the, that and also that the state uh, produces both food and pest crops and rice is the major and staple food crops grown in assam and other important pest crops in the state are tea jute sugarcane oil seed tobacco and cotton so because due to this region so that we are checking the actually what is the trends is going on for the particular crops so which are grown in assam so here i have uh, considered only the just uh, three crops that's uh, four varieties of rice and uh, zoot and uh, rapeseed and mustard that is a major oil seed crops in assam and zoot but this is actually nowadays it's declining but it is a very important cash crops fiber crops in assam so that rice and jute it, it is actually affect on the economy of assam so it is a prime importance to study the area production and yield of above selected crops so it have a great impact on the state economy and as well as the uh, national economy so in this study so i have used man candel test and sand slope estimator so this this test and this is my review of literature so that means lots of uh, scientists have done uh, the work on the trend analysis using some on some agricultural crops but um, there is a very few study done in assam uh, to check the trend using the man candel and sand slope estimator to check the trend of the uh, selected agricultural crops so here the data and methodology so that um, for this uh, study i have collected secondary data from different issues of director of economics and statistics gov of assam so within the period from uh, 1951 to 2018 
and here mencangle test is used to check the significance of trend and uh, which is actually that increasing or decreasing trend it will give by mencangle test and the sense slope estimator will use data that is used for magnitude to check the magnitude of trend so here this is some description of mencangle test so that is just a mathematical concept so then uh, sand slope estimator, this is sand slope estimator for what purposes actually we have used. So then we have used to check the uh, significance and magnitude of trend from that uh, sand slope estimator. And here, oh, sorry. So here, this is actual results and discussion. So first I have considered the winter rice. There are, we have considered four varieties of rice. So winter rice, so there is a law means what the main candle value as well as a P value and sand slope value. So I have actually divided into uh, that uh, from the group uh, 1951 to 2018, I have divided into some decadal group. So that is 1951 to 1960. So that I have arranged these actually what uh, seven groups uh, from the 1951 to 2018. I have said uh, for holder groups also. So that I have considered here area production and yield of uh, that uh, winter rice, all the crops, selected crops. So here we have seen, um, so that means what the area production and yield of winter rice for whole time season comes to be significant and with increasing trend. So that means what, that here P value, that P value is uh, or 000. 000 all have the value is very highly significant. So that means what, here, that's why I put here significant at 1% probability level, where I put that double star, it, the, it means the significant at 1% uh, probability level and single, single star represents the that 5% uh, probability level. And we have seen here for the period, for the whole period, the area production yield have, that means that have a significant and increasing trend. And the sense slope estimator that both of the production is all over the year than 36490 and the highest growth is, is under in the year we are the 2000 within the period 2011 to 2018 that is 72974 kg per ill or oh, sorry per hectare so that is stone sorry so then that means what the, the then and it is also observed that the increasing trend for the segmentation year whereas yield and area follow decreasing trend in the sub time series that is decreasing trend means where actually out of this data set so only just yield have some uh, that negative value from here negative value so the negative value represents there is some decreasing trend and indeed that positive value represents there is a, some increasing trend and from the sense of estimator we have to we are uh, that we uh, will we have uh, got that which actually that um, variable and which the, and on what year the product that gives the highest actually what growth and and lowest growth by using the sand slope estimator. So from the sand slope estimator, so it is statistically significant and maximum growth rate occurs in the type sub time series 2011 to 2018. So I have already told these things. So that means what that products moderate that product that production of winter rice is moderately increasing and it may be due to extension of cultivation area adoption of high link varieties enterprise of the farmers themselves etc it may be uh, this is this may be the region uh, for actually increasing the production and this is a good sign uh, for assam so then and this scenario will help actually improve our assam economy of assam also so now that this is the result of autumn rice and uh, this autumn rice so that uh, same actually what the that here we have seen but this is actually that autumn rice is day means year by year it is decreasing uh, so it is not a good sign so now here area is decreasing but production is uh, increasing only so and there is a some significant uh, influence significant and increasing trend of production and yield so and but uh, but we in we have seen in some years actually 
actually there is a some negative vote negative vote so there is a some break point okay so that that means what that from here actually the significant trend for area in most of the um, means there is a some significant trend of area and for area and production it comes to be decreasing trend from the year 91 to that's why that 91 to 90 uh, 91 to 2000 so there is a decreasing trend so this is a value of the production and also that from the sense of estimator it has been observed that the highest significant annual growth for production occurred in the time series sub 1961 to 1970 so this is highest growth rate in occurred in the time series this is 1970 to 10377 only and lowest is what lowest is uh, occurred in the last time last uh, this year the 2011 to 2018 so it represents actually so that uh, now that autumn rice is actually following the decreasing trend um, uh, so this is that uh, due to some actually what the uh, exploiting of agricultural land for human settlement constructing uh, constructing brick field so now it's happened so it's, uh, that means what that, that may be the region uh, due to for for affecting the area and as well as the production so these are the my results of summarize so that man can tell that, that this is that, that means we have seen here most of the variables area production and ill have shown a very significant and high, high, highly significant result uh, from uh, on summarize and the uh, that in the uh, means what from the sand slope estimator we can conclude that means what uh, in 1991 to uh, 2000 during that period the highest production occurred on that 1991 to 2000 so that is 39714 so here actually the production is uh, means what the, there is a no negative growth only as production and yield on the year 1971 and 80 they have uh, some negative growth so this is my these are my discussion from the summer right so Please that summarize within two minutes Please yeah, summarize okay. within two minutes Yes, okay. So these are the my results and discussion. Same way the total rise have actually over the period had these uh, or the area production ill. Both have actually both all, all the three factors are highly significant and there is a some increasing trend and they have uh, means what the highest growth is 53, uh, 3,339. Uh, so these are the results and discussion from the total rise and Zoot. And Zoot is actually now means our in our assumption Zoot the Crop of Zoot actually it is declining. So why actually it is declining? So we have uh, that means what the uh, that there is a very big industry actually uh, there was very big industry for Zoot. Now actually that a destroy means uh, during this actually decreasing trend uh, trend line and decreasing production. So that actually that uh, means destroyed our livelihood of farmers. And now production of rose become very minimum. So uh, this is the region that maybe we have to do some uh, study uh, for that actually particular region so that's why we have seen the just the trend line and this is rapid and mustard it is of uh, it is also actually increasing trend though that within the period of 1951 to 2000 2018 and due to maybe um, that there is a some actually what the, some uh, some production may have uh, negative value but it, during some period though they that may be actually what the, the, the that may be effect on the natural calamities means uh, like as a rain or a flood okay so that means climatic variables and pressure Weather variables it may affect production and this is my conclusion the study of agricultural crops in Assam will carry a great impact on the state economy and policy planners and this study indicated on long-term trends of area production and yield of major important foods and test crops in Assam and these results of trend analysis for each crop reveal that area production and yield of all selected crops for all time series are comes to be significant and there is a great improvement in the yield value for all the crops except Zood in the last segmentation period all the crops followed an increasing trend for area production and yield only area of autumn rice and youth followed a declining trend and production of youth followed a declining trend this growth of winter rice summer rice total rice rapid and master may be due to expansion of cultivation of area adoption of high yield varieties enterprise of the farmers themselves this growth will make the state one state one of the major producing state in the country 
So there is a region uh, for declining trend of zoot in Assam. The larger area of zoot cultivation is being transformed to other crops. And this has dressed up the livelihood of farmers and zoot workers. Now production of rock uh, means that this crop will bring a revamping on the state economy. It will make some policy for the significant crop. And further study might help in understanding the behavior of agricultural crops and better assessment of the impact. These are my reference and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice presentation. And I want to mention that the maximum time time for each presenter present, presenter is ten minutes. So all presenter will take care of the time. On now the next presenter is Dr. Jyoti S. Vankade. Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Please start. Yes, sir. Please allow me to share uh, share my screen, sir. Okay. okay. Mrs. Nivak, please your uh, please you unshare your screen. Okay. Sorry, just a minute. Yes. Yes. Now you can share your screen. Yes. Sir. Uh, am I audible and my screen is this, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, respected chairperson, senior faculty members, and my dear colleagues. Myself, Dr. Jyoti Vankhade, assistant professor, Department of Conservative Dentistry, Government Dental College and Hospital, Nagpur. Uh, uh, Please, presenting put, your presentation. put your screen in presentation mode. Uh, yes, sir. It is in presentation mode on my laptop, sir. But we are not showing. Now is it? Can no, you no, see no. my uh, changing slides, sir? No? Slides are visible, but uh, not in a presentation mode. The PPT should be uh, full screen. Please put F5 or the column below showing that. Uh, it's full screen on my laptop. Okay, let me start. Okay, no problem. Uh, sir, it is uh, full screen on my laptop, sir. Uh, sir, again okay, try. Okay. Because it is full screen on my laptop, sir. Okay, okay, ma'am. Please start. So now the visible full screen. Please start. It may be some technical issue. Please, you may start. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, can you see my uh, slides changing? Yes, the slides are visible. Is it... are these slides are visible, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, respected chairperson, uh, faculty members, and my dear colleagues. Myself, Dr. Jyoti Vankhade, Assistant Professor, Department of Conservative Dentistry, Government and College and Hospital, Nagpur. Uh, I my topic, clinical diagnosis uh, uh, of, uh, sir, is it, is it visible now? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, some uh, issues are there with uh, this visibility, sir? It's visible, madam. Okay, okay, sir. So this is a pilot study assessing depth of proximal caries with conventional and laser-induced laser fluorescence technique. These are contained. Dental caries is an infectious microbial disease which result in dissolution of inorganic container and disruption of organic content of tooth. Slides are not moving. Sir, uh, may, I rejoin? may I rejoin for the same? Yeah, it only in today. The first slide is showing only. Okay, okay. Please allow me to uh, again uh, share the screen and again rejoin, sir. Please share the screen.
Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, my screen is visible now. Yes, Hello. Is... Yes. yes, yes. Now the moving part is also visible, sir. No, 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 ma'am. Please open your PPT. Your folder is I visible. Open... Uh, sir, I open my PPT on uh, laptop. Is it, op it? It is open on my laptop, sir. But here not showing. Here your folder is open only. Mishan, we are technical problem. So we are lagging behind the schedule. We can call up next participant, ma'am. Please wait for a few minutes and next after the next presentation, you will okay. share your screen. It may be some technical issues. Okay, okay, sir. I'll try again. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll uh, try again. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now we call Priyatma Meshram. Dr. Priyat Priyatma Meshram. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Yes, madam, you are with. Yes, yes. Just a second, sir. I'll share. Uh... Dr. Jyoti, ma'am, please uh, unshare your screen. Dr. Sushil. Dr. Dr. Sushil, please unshare the screen of Dr. Jyoti. Okay, okay. Dr. Jyoti, uh, sir, kindly allow me to share the screen. Yes, now you can share. Yes, yes. Yes, your screen is visible. Uh, is it visible, sir? Yes, yes. madam, you start. Not in PPT mode. Yes, Full now screen it is. Mode. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay. A warm good afternoon to respected chairperson, senior faculty members, and my dear colleagues. Myself, Dr. Priyatama Meshram, Professor, Department of Dentistry, Government Medical College, Gondia, Maharashtra. Uh, I am currently pursuing PhD on nanomaterials used in endodontics. So this is the overview of role of uh, nanoscience in endodontics. What exactly endodontics or root canal treatment means? It means when the tooth gets uh, infected, we uh, open the uh, tooth, we clean the uh, pulp inside the tooth, we uh, irrigate it, disinfect it, and then we place intracanal medicament and fill the cavity with an inert biological material called gutta percha. So these are the uh, procedures of root canal treatment. And for this treatment, we use uh, uh, routine uh, procedures, but there are chances of failure. And the failure is mostly because of presence of bacteria. And the commonly seen bacteria is E. fecalis. It possesses various capabilities to survive. So uh, in recent future, nanotechnology has substantially progressed in past few decades, giving rise to numerous possible applications in different biomedical fields. In particular, the use of nanomaterials particles in endodontics has generated significant interest due to their unique characteristics. As a result of their nanoscale dimensions, nanoparticle possesses several properties that may enhance the treatment of endodontic infection, such as heightened antimicrobial activity, increased reactivity and the capacity to be functionalized with the other reactive compounds. Nanoscience is a study of structure is a convergence of physics, material science, and biology, which deals with manipulation of materials at atomic and molecular scales. Nanotechnology's ability to observe measures, manipulate, assemble, control, and manufacture matter at nanometer scales. This term was first coined in 1974 by Norrie Tanguich. Okay. The use of nanoparticle is mainly for disinfection process to increase success rate. The mechanism for uh, mechanism of nanoparticles as an antibacterial way 
is this nanoparticles enters the cell by electrostatic interaction by causing a uh, damage to cell membrane and increasing cell permeability and this uh, nanoparticles damage the internal organs of the cells and thus they uh, make inactive the uh, bacteria cells uh, inactive the nanoparticles that are used in endodontics are silver nanoparticles chitosan zinc oxide calcium hydroxide bioactive glass nano diamond embedded root uh, gutta percha and uh, nano uh, nano particles embedded in root canal sealer first silver nano particles today morning session mr nb singh has very well explained silver nano particles synthesis their application in our day to day life so this silver nano particle is a well established in endodontic field for its antibacterial property in case of dental application silver and its nano particle has been tested for application as a dental restorative material endodontic retrograde filling materials dental implants and caries inhibitory solution mechanism of action is same penetration and then degradation of cellular content limitation of this material is it causes uh, discoloration of dentin and it causes uh, cytotoxicity towards uh, mammalian cells clinically it is used for disinfection for disinfection we use irrigation and intracanal medicament and then for filling the root canal we use root canal sealer the next uh, nanoparticle is of chitosan chitosan is a deacinated derivative of chitin is the second most abundant natural biopolymer nanoparticles of chitosan could be synthesized or assembled using different methods depending on the end application or the physical characteristics required in nanoparticles Chitosan has excellent antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal properties. In case of bacteria, gram-positive bacteria are more susceptible than gram-negative ones. And the mechanism of action is same that of electrostatic attraction of positively charged chitosan with negatively charged bacterial cell membrane. This altered cell permeability, eventually uh, resulting in rupture of cell, leakage of proteinaceous and other intracellular components. clinical application irrigation of root canal then root canal sealant and then tissue engineering it is used next uh, bioactive material uh, is bioactive glass it is osteo inductive effect and antibacterial properties its mechanism of action is it has high ph and increase in ph because of reasons of ions in an aqueous environment osmotic effect and calcium and phosphate precipitation induced mineralization of the bacterial surface it has clinical application is same that improve root canal disinfection next nanoparticle is zinc oxide nanoparticles its mechanism of action is same uh, that of silver nanoparticles here the combination of silver nanoparticles along with zinc nanoparticles shows superior antimicrobial efficacy against e fecalis compared to when each was used independently it possesses a degree of cytotoxicity hence risk assessment and biocompatibility studies are paramount before proceeding to in vivo research then calcium hydroxide nanoparticles we routinely use calcium hydroxide powder as a intra canal uh, dressing material but when we use nanoparticles we get its eff uh, effect very positively and in large amount In, that is improved depth of penetration increased surface area contact with pathogens superior solubility and greater antimicrobial activity several studies have found that nano calcium showed deeper penetration into dentinal tubules and has antibacterial activity against e fecalis compared to conventional hydroxide cytotoxicity was found to be greater for nano calcium hydroxide compared to conventional calcium hydroxide Hello, uh, yes sir I'm audible. Yes, yes sir. Uh, can I proceed, sir? Yes, yes, yes. You may ah. proceed. Okay, okay. Uh, next is quaternary ammonium compounds. It is a broad spectrum antimicrobial, antibiofilm properties via electrostatic interaction with bacterial cell membrane, same leading to cell damage and cellular leakage, uh, leakage of cellular constituent. it induced intracellular signals that lead to programmed cell death compounds are capable of offer, offering long term antimicrobial effect due to their insoluble nature improve the bacterial action of sealer by not only directly disrupting membrane integrity 
but also indirectly acting as on distinct regions of biofilms. The potential drawbacks of this nanomaterial such as polymerization, shrinkage, solvent absorption, altered mechanical properties and cytotoxicities are seen. Then for filling the root canal, we use gutta percha. So nanoparticles, uh, studies has been going on that uh, this gutta percha is embedded with uh, diamond nanoparticles and they are used in vitro studies. But the potential drawback of this nanomaterial is polymerization shrinkage, solvent sorption, altered mechanical properties and cytotoxicity. To conclude, the advances in nanotechnology may lead to new era of transitional applications of nanoparticles in endodontic treatment. The current literature suggests that nanoparticles may be developed for a variety of purposes in endodontics, such as disinfection strategies, photodynamic therapy, obturation materials, and regenerative uh, procedures. Thus, nanoparticles application in endodontics have a lot of potential but there is still some way to go before the basic research translates to clinical studies. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pratima, sorry, Priyatma, for completing your presentation in within time. Very Thank nice you. work and very interesting. I am also interested in this type of work. Okay, sir. I will contact you later. Sure, sure. Now, Definitely, our, next, sir. now our next presenter is S. Kavita, Dr. Mrs. S. Kavita, Dr. S. Kavita, Dr. S. Kavita, please unshare your screen. Sure. Just a second, sir. Dr. S. Kavita. I think she is not available now. Our next presenter is Mr. Dinesh Pandit. Good afternoon, sir. I am audible there. Yes, yes. Good. Sorry, okay. Dr. Dinesh. Please share your screen and start your presentation. Okay, sir, my PPT is visible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Dinesh Pandit. I am presenting uh, the paper, Geology of Copper Mineralization around Amrakabas area in Alwar Basin, Rajasthan. This is basically part of my student's PhD work, uh, R. Sajib, which is currently working in Geological Survey of India, Government of India. So the study area is basically located in the northern part of India and almost uh, northern part of Rajasthan also, which is geologically known as Aravali Karatan. This area is basically, uh, in terms of geological, it is a paleoprotetic time, which uh, belongs to a uh, geologically formation called uh, northern uh, North Delhi Cold Bay. And this fold is well explored for different uh, base metal mineralization. Um, among them, copper is one of the significant uh, metal which has been explored in this part of the area. In this area, one of the famous uh, Khetri copper belt is also located where significant copper mining is carried out. Besides this, uh, a number of locations is further identified by geological survey of area for detailed exploration. One among them is Amuniyabas Khera area, which is uh, located uh, in the uh, uh, Alvar Basin. And besides this uh, location, uh, it is in the located in the Alvar district. But geologically, we say this is Alvar basin because its structure is look like to be a uh, syncline or a curvilinear uh, uh, body. This is the study area located where uh, the present exploration task has been carried out, and we have collected some sample to identify the potential source for uh, copper ore minerals. There are large number of uh, study has been carried out, including geological mapping, geochemical analysis, field work. And uh, based on that, Geological Survey of India identify that this area is potential source for copper ore and uh, estimated around 30 million tons of copper ore reserve in the, in the area of study. These are the, some of the evidences that show that copper mineralization occur uh, in this uh, rock, which are uh, basically a um, healthy, uh, the volcanic rocks. 
the prominent uh, ore minerals are pyrotite, chalcopyrite, and some other associations there. You can see in the photograph that golden yellow color that represent the copper ore mineralization within the Hospra. If you see the surface photograph, these rocks are looks to be slightly uh, white or gray, uh, white in color with reddish mark uh, present on that. That indicates these uh, uh, rocks containing uh, uh, significant amount of uh, copper uh, within that hospra. Uh, previous study, they have uh, identified some Landsat images to identify the potential uh, source uh, in a rock where we can uh, detail uh, explosion can be carried out at ground level. In ground uh, or in the field, you can identify some kind of green specks on the rocks or green marks on the rocks, which represents that uh, these rocks are very suitable or characteristics for copper mineralization in the area of study. These rocks are basically uh, dolomite, a kind of carbonate rock. If you see the satellite image, there are characteristic blue color or uh, greenish blue color mark has been appeared in the uh, area where uh, we are targeting this kind of copper mineralization. If you geologically characterize, and these uh, rocks are divided into um, the part of the Delhi super group of rocks, which are further divided into three groups, Ajayabgar, Alwar, and Rallo, in terms of their time correlation. Among them, the Thanagaji formation basically targeted for uh, this uh, copper mineralization in the present study. You can see some field photographs. These uh, green color uh, marks are present in this area that are uh, rocks of Thanagaji formation, which are basically the uh, indicate that presence of copper mineralization in this area. Some more photographs, these are some uh, carbon phyllite, black color rocks, which also uh, present some sulfide effects at microscopic level. And uh, these rocks also show some kind of green uh, colors, but uh, these rocks are now target for uh, uh, detailed uh, study on copper mineralization. Besides this, you can also find some white color, uh, this uh, uh, carbonate rocks, normally known as calcite, along with this uh, uh, gray color quartz are also present in these rocks, which are basically uh, secondary in nature. They are formed after the formation of these rocks. You can see some uh, folded structures are also present, which re represent that uh, these areas have undergone significant tectonic activities and resulting in the uh, change in their shape uh, of their uh, arrangement. But uh, they are also hosting some kind of green marks over there. So that indicates the even tectonic activity also promoting significant mineralization in this area. There are some, you can see dark color marks on the rocks. Actually, if you see the microscopic photograph, these are red color marks uh, containing some kind of um, uh, sulfide minerals. But in the field, you can see these are uh, reddish brown color uh, marks over the rocks. So those indicate basically presence of copper mineralization in the area of the study. Is more some uh, different types of marks are also present in different parts of rock. They have different lithology, but all have been showing this kind of reddish brown color marks. If you see the microscopic photograph, uh, under microscope, these are uh, dark mineral or completely uh, black in color. So, uh, so they represent, these are basically oxide or sulfide ore minerals, mostly copper sulfide or iron sulfides are present. So they are consistent with the field observations. If you see a microscope photograph under reflected light, then you find some uh, bright color or golden yellow color uh, minerals or grains are present. So these golden yellow colors are basically copper sulfide, which indicates. So field observation, microscope accuracy consistent with our observation that this area has been potential copper mineralizations. Some more photographs of different uh, textures or uh, different arrangements of these uh, iron sulfide and copper sulfide minerals. These iron sulfides are basically pyrotypes. And these golden yellow colors are chalcopyrite, these are copper uh, sulfide ore minerals. They represent a coliform type of texture which primarily developed in the area of study. From this study, we can uh, identify some of the uh, fundamental uh, observation that these uh, oh, rocks are suitable for base metal mineralization. And these rocks are basically calcium volcanic in nature and fine grain. Uh, which basically uh, found throughout the Alvar Basin, and those are target for detailed exploration of uh, copper mineralization. In this area, uh, the potential uh, mineralization has been studied by some other workers, and they also suggested that this, uh, this uh, mineralization could be uh, very akin towards uh, a volcanogen of massive sulfide deposits or volcanogenic uh, hosted massive sulfide deposit to be classified. Uh, 
these are the publication from which we have a, some part of the work has been published and remainings are uh, going to be published. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dinesh Pandit for a nice presentation. Now we call up uh, Dr. Jyoti. Uh, please uh, unshare. Good afternoon, please. sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. So please allow me to share my screen. Dr. Dinesh Pandit ji, please unshare your screen. Just a one minute. Eh? Sir, you can share from your side. I have some issues. Oh. 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 Okay, Dr. Jyoti, please share the screen. Please allow me to share my screen. Dr. Susil. Dr. Susil. Please mute yourself. Good afternoon, sir. So now my screen yes, is yes. visible. Yes. Now is it moving? Moving screen is yes, also yes, visible, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry for yes, interruption, yes. sir. So, uh, yes. myself, Dr. Jyoti Vankhade from Government Dental College and Hospital Nagpur, presenting before you clinical diagnosis of proximal caries with conventional and laser-induced fluorescence technique. This is a pilot study assessing depth of proximal caries with conventional and laser-induced fluorescence technique. Contains sir. Uh, this is the uh, ICDS2 criteria. We all know that dental caries is infectious microbial disease, which results in dissolution in, of inorganic container and destruction of organic content of the tooth. The uh, small visible cavity can be larger one uh, when we actually move inside the tooth uh, while clinical invasion. So we need to diagnose it accurately for preserve more and more preservation of tooth. Early diagnosis is important for preservation as well as to stop the spread of infection. So there are various methods by which we can detect the caries clinically. One of them, the evidence-based method, visual technique is ICDS2 criteria, that is International Caries Detection and Assessment System. Uh, this is the modification of ICDS2 criteria, which we used here today, uh, used here in the study. Uh, there is limitation of visual technique. Uh, so there are other techniques are also available. Uh, nowadays, digital radiograph we are using to detect the proximal depth of caries lesion. Uh, but other methods are also available. For example, laser-induced fluorescence method, which is uh, Diagnodent. Diagnodent uh, is a laser-induced fluorescence device where diode laser with 655 nanometer is ir irradiated on dental surface. It is absorbed by metabolites of bacteria and these metabolites emits a red light. The system collects this fluorescence and provides quantitative measures of caries lesion. As the early detection is important for uh, determining treatment plan and preservation of more and more tooth structure, the study uh, is planned, is conducted, was conducted with the aim to compare the accuracy of diagnodent with visual ICDS2 criteria and diagnodent uh, for detection of depth of proximal caries lesion. Research question whether the diagnodent detects proximal caries depth accurately when compared with visual ICDS2 criteria and digital radiograph. Null hypothesis was accepted before starting the study. There is no difference in accuracy of diagnosis when compared with visual ICDS2 criteria and digital radiograph for detection of depth of proximal caries. Material methods, study design was diagnostic accuracy study, study setup, government dental college and hospital Nagpur, study population, patient with complaint of food lodgement and posterior teeth with or without complaint of pain. Duration, June and July month, uh, the patient coming to outpatient department of uh, Department of Conservative Dentistry uh, with the proximal carious lesion, having complaint of food lodgement, and uh, they may have uh, complaint of pain uh, or may not have complaint of pain. Sampling te technique is convenient te sampling technique as the patient reporting to the hospital, uh, we consider those patients only, and 
here the patient who matches with the uh, inclusion criteria and who are willing to participate in the study is considered for the study equipment used was dynodent a fluor laser fluorescence based device why this device was used because we are working on a newer device a innovation which is based on laser so we want to know what are the disadvantages of previous devices so that we can move ahead with it so uh, the uh, there are three groups first one is visual icds2 criteria uh, second is dynodent and third is digital radiograph uh, here uh, 36 patient were selected for the study uh, in uh, among them uh, 15 were having two carious teeth and other uh, 21 patient has only single carious tooth so for uh, carious analysis we have 51 carious proximal carious teeth which we analyzed first by using visual icds2 criteria then same teeth were analyzed using dynodent and same teeth were analyzed by digital radiographic method and it was compared uh, with uh, clinical invasion with round bar to actually clinically evaluate whether the actual depth of carious is that much or not uh, the readings are uh taken as zero no carious lesion one uh, carries in the outer enamel two uh, inner enamel carries three uh, outer dentinal carries and four inner dentinal carries this is how the icds2 criteria we have used magnification straight probe to detect the smaller looking lesion could be a larger inside as the surface enamel is more tougher when compared with subsurface enamel and dentine these are the digital radiograph in which the contrast is better than the conventional radiograph to detect the depth of carious lesion this is the dynodent which is laser induced device so first we uh, calibrated the device on sound enamel and for every person we calibrated on the sound uh, tooth structures on sound non carious tooth structure then we took uh, three readings of each tooth and the average is considered as the final reading so coming to observation and results here the blue uh, color shows a correct finding when compared with gold standard uh, with clinical invasion Uh, orange shows underestimation of depth and uh, green shows overestimation of depth this this is for icds2 criteria this is for digital radiograph and this is for dynodent so as you can make out that uh, more uh, gray, blue area more true determination of caries is there with uh, dynodent that is laser laser induced device uh, when we compare it there is uh, in 25% of cases we get true a uh, detection of depth of cavity with visual icds2 criteria with radiograph we get 57% only and with dynodent we uh, get two detect true detection among 90.78% uh, of cases kappa value was used to assess the interexaminer agreement uh, there is more agreement with dynodent at is as it is a device and there is uh, we rely on the quantitative measure rather than the visual icds2 criteria which rely is it is a subjective method so inter examiner agreement varies uh, to conclude icds2 for while assessing uh, the depth of proximal caries with icds2 criteria only 25% true assessment is there whereas 73% underestimation and 2% overestimation is there uh, while the previous research is there on the whether the caries is present or not in that case the icds2 criteria is better uh, when compared with uh, conventional sometimes with conventional radiographs also because conventional radiograph underestimate the result because for with uh, for radiograph to be visible on the radiograph it should be Uh, there should be 40% uh, demineralization of the tooth structure but here when we are assessing the depth icds2 criteria shows uh, only 25% true assessment of depth assessment with digital radiograph there is 57% true assessment as with digital digital radiograph better contrast is there 40% underestimation and 3% overestimation of result is there with dynodent assessment for assessment of depth of proximal uh, Caries, ninety-one percent true assessment of uh, depth is there. Three percent underestimation and ten percent overestimation is there. there. This overestimation can result in false false positive response. That's why we cannot rely alone on this dynodent. Also, we need to use it with other techniques. Uh, so uh, we cannot use it uh, uh, as a single diagnostic unit. We need to use it with digital radiograph or with in combination with uh, visual techniques. so the results are in accordance with the uh, alamar uh, et al and uh, in contrast with the uh, tilipore uh, 
uh, so here this is a pilot uh, project which we, which we did on uh, the patient uh, which are already detected or which com uh, already uh, complain of food lodgement in that particular area and all the cases were having caries so here we detected only depth we are we concentrated on only depth of proximal carious lesion so that we can decide the treatment plan well in advance before starting the patient and we can preserve more and more amount of tooth structure while uh, removing the carious lesion and preserve the uh, more amount of tooth structure at early stage so these are my references Thank you for patience listening. Thank you, National Conference uh, on Advancement in Interdisciplinary Research. So we will Thank further. Thank you, yes. for a nice presentation. Now we call up uh, Alay Sagar Rahman. Mr. Alay Sagar Rahman. Thank you, Ali Asir Rahman. Please share a screen and start your presentation. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Go to PPT mode, full screen mode. Okay. Good evening, dear all. This is Elias Rahmandus, PhD scholar of education from Jamia Milia Islamia, New Delhi. The research title is The Status of Information and Communication Technology of Omani and Iranian Portuguese State. Student. The main aim of this study is to compare the status of ICT usage among Omani and Iranian fourth grade students. What are the objectives of this study? The first one is to study Iranian and Omani students' ICT usage status, to study the difference between boys and girls' ICT usage status among Omani and Iranian students. And the third, to study the relationship between students' accessibility to ICT facilities with their achievement rate in the team's mathematics assessment. The research methodology was followed a quantitative research uh, approach, which was descriptive correlational research design, as well as a comparative research that uh, compared boys' and girls' ICT usage status. Also, the, the nature of research is secondary analysis because the team, the data have been collected from team's assessment. The, the population is sampling from both uh, Oman and Iran. The method was randomized sampling. As you can see, 9,105 uh, students from Oman and that 49.7% uh, of them were girls and 50.3% were boys as well as uh, from Iran 3,823 uh, students have been selected from Iran that were 48.7% girls and 51.3% boys. The statistical tools for uh, collecting data have been collected from team's assessment uh, tools that the, the tools have been modified by the researcher and the tools have been extracted from students' uh, tool uh, from home questionnaire and school questionnaire that the total number of the items were 14 uh, numbers. The scoring method of the uh, tools were uh, for yes one and for no zero uh, was allocated. And the uh, list uh, for um, Likert type scale was uh, one and for the most or maximum score, which was every day or almost every day for checking out the ICT usage and how they use ICT tools during uh, educational purpose or do, do during uh, completing homework, which was four. These are the descriptive findings. As you can see, there were uh, five dimensions uh, which were asked uh, uh, from the students uh, to find out whether uh, their ICT usage or their accessibility to ICT devices uh, or tools. The first one was on computer or laptop that 49%, uh, uh, almost 60% of Omani students stated that they have their own computer or laptop. And this uh, amount for Iranian was 49 or 48.6 that the Omani students stated a greater portion. 
for sharing computer or tablet, they were asked uh, whether they have a sharing computer with other family members. 63.2% 60, of Omani students said that, that they have a sharing computer, and this uh, portion for Iranian was 49.1%. Uh, that the amount for Omani was great. Uh, that shows that Omani students are using a sharing computer more than Iranian. The third uh, dimension was uh, uh, they were asked about interne uh, internet connection, the accessibility to internet connection. 49% of, or almost 60% of Omani students, they stated they uh, have accessibility to internet connection, while this amount for Iranian is very low in compared to Omani, which was 45%. The students were asked uh, um, that they have own cell phone uh, for doing homework or um, uh, teaching, uh, I mean, educational activity where they are uh, dealing with educational purpose. They said 35% of students said they are using own person, uh, personal or own cell phone from Oman and from Iran. This uh, portion was greater um, that the preferred using own cell phone or personal phone for doing homework over the computer. For gaming system also, as you can see, 60% almost uh, Omani students stated that they have a gaming system, and this one for Iranian was uh, almost 39%. These are the graphs, as you can see. Um, the, the comparative between Omanian and Iranian students. And in own cell phone, the Omanian students uh, portion was very really low in compared to Iranian that they are using for a homework. Also, we compare the ICT usage status uh, uh, between the gender for both countries. Uh, uh, the first row is for girls and the second is for boys. As you can see, in all dimensions, uh, um, boys uh, mean were greater than the girls. It shows that uh, boys' uh, accessibility to ICT facility to device, laptop, or cell phone were greater than girls for, uh, for Oman. As you can see here, for Iranian also, uh, the result is the same. Um, uh, Iranian boys' uh, accessibility to ICT facility and devices also were greater than the girls. These are the graphs. These are the quantitative part of the findings and the first hypothesis which claimed uh, that Oman and Iranian student ICT usage status is the same with the average rate of ICT usage status among participating countries in the team's assessment. Uh, so the test value have been collected from the average rate of participating countries, which were 60 countries that participated in team's assessment, mathematics assessment. So the average um, uh, rate uh, or the value of the using of ICT was 50. As you can say for Oman, we compared, so the Omani students mean uh, in compared to test value is very low uh, as it's significant. Also, uh, as you can um, uh, see in L or U, lower or upper mean, which shows the negative um, that the second mean group, uh, uh, the second group's mean were greater that were boys, as we mentioned earlier, that the boys' ICT usage is greater. Also, Iranian I mean, uh, in compared to the test value, is very low. Uh, and in compared with Omani, Omani students' um, uh, mean is greater than Iranian, which shows in Iranian Omani students' ICT usage status is better than uh, Iranian. The second hypothesis was uh, another hypothesis that, that claimed there is no significant difference between boys and girls' ICT usage status among Omani and Iranian students. As you can see here, as, uh, at L and U, it's uh, negative, which shows the second group's mean is greater than the first, which was girls, which was a girl. 
So as a, you can take uh, see years, the boys mean is greater, 29.7. Almost there is no much differences, but it's significant. And for Iranian, it's the same also. Boys, uh, ICT usage means is greater. So we can conclude that boys in both country, Oman and Iran, Oman and Iran their uh, ICT usage uh, status is, uh, are better than the girls when they are dealing with uh, educational activities. The third and last objective was uh, an alternative object, uh, hypothesis. There is a significant relationship. Sir, please, sorry to interrupt, sir. Please conclude your work. It's the last. There is a significant relationship between students' access to ICT facilities with their achievement rate in the themes of mathematics that, as we can see, uh, the correlation shows it's very low, almost it's correlated, but it's very low. And compared with Iranian, so Iranian mm, correlation amount showing a greater portion. Thank you so much for your. Thank you for nice presentation. Now I think all presentation are done. All six presentation has completed. Now the mic is over to Dr. Susil Singh. Hello. Dr. Susil Singh. Hello. Dr. Susil Singh, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Nisant, uh, sir, uh, for chairing this uh, session. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, the participants, uh, those uh, of the ID uh, A13 to 18. The names of the participants, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Dr. Pallavi Sumit, Dr. Chintas Mani, Dr. Lachimi Tanwar, Dr. Rasmi Mathur, Dr. Harish. So now I would like to invite Dr. Sanjay Kumar Sinde. Dr. S. Kumar Sande, please come. Dr. Ali, please uh, unshare your screen. Now I would invite to Dr. Sanjay S. Kumar. Next, Dr. Pallavi Sumit. Dr. Pallavi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, visible. Yes. Uh, very good afternoon. Can I start? Sorry. So, can I start? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. A uh, very good afternoon to respected chairperson my colleagues who are presenting their presentations. Uh, I am Dr. Pallavi Son Pimple, Assistant Professor and PhD Scholar from the Department of Periodontology. To begin with, I will tell you what is this branch of periodontology. Uh, I am a dentist by profession and periodontology is a branch which deals with gum diseases. So accordingly, my topic of presentation is knowledge, attitude and use of dental floss among dental students. And it is a cross-sectional study. To begin with, what is dental plaque? So dental plaque in very simple terms is the soft deposits which, uh, which, are, which deposit around the teeth. And it is one of the main etiological factor for periodontal diseases as well as for the etiology of caries. Periodontal diseases uh, uh, include the inflammation of the gingiva basically. And effective removal of this plaque is a gold standard for its prevention. But uh, many studies and American Dental Association has also said that alone uh, toothbrushing is inadequate for effective removal of bacterial plaque. And hence, use of dental floss is very important. So, uh, ma'am, your, uh, ma your screen is not visible. 
So your PPT is not not visible, sir. Not started. Please start your slides. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Visible now? Yes, visible. Yes, Please sir. Uh, so, in addition to using toothbrush, we also have to use the dental floss to optimize our oral hygiene. And uh, hence, to in instill a positive oral hygiene practice amongst the people, dentists themselves have to be a role model for their patients, family, and society. And hence, this study was conducted to assess the knowledge, attitude, and use of dental floss as a preventive measure among the dental students. So we conducted this study at in two dental colleges in Nagpur, Maharashtra, and it consisted of 12 questionnaires, and it was distributed amongst three groups of students. Group one consisted of undergraduate preclinical students. Preclinical students are the ones who have not yet started with the patients. And uh, second group consisted of the students who have started working on the patients. And group three consisted of postgraduate students. And this was the 12 point questionnaire. So we have asked all these questions to the students. And then we collected the data. And uh, uh, of the 250 students, 217 replied on a five point Likert scale, which consisted of the answers of strongly agree, agree, undecided, disagree, and strongly disagree. Uh, the PG, the UG and PG students who were interested were included, whereas those who were not interested or undergoing any kind of ortho treatment were excluded. SPSS version 16 was used for analysis. Frequency and percentages were calculated and chi-square test was used for comparison of knowledge about the use of dental floss amongst preclinical, clinical, and postgraduate students. Statistical significance was kept at the p-value of 0 0.05. We have taken ethical clearance from the Institutional Ethical Committee, as well as permission was taken from the deans. The results uh, of the 217 students, uh, the UG preclinical were 48, UG clinical were 128, PG students were 41. 181 females as against 36 males. And uh, the results were that majority of the students agreed that brushing twice daily is enough for maintaining oral health care. Large number of participants were also worried about sticky deposits on their teeth and also about the bleeding gums. Many of the preclinical students agreed that they had not been taught professional use of dental floss. Uh, Many PG students and uh, clinical students prescribed dental floss to the patients who have gingival or periodontal diseases. 90% of the students were aware of gum diseases, uh, which begin in the interdental area, but only 65.89% stu students prescribed it to their patients. 67.2% of clinical students and 43.9% of PG students think of patients' socioeconomic status while prescribing it. So uh, the, this is a pie diagram showing dental floss use amongst the students themselves. As we can see the postgraduate students, maximum number of postgraduate students use dental floss as against the UG students. So uh, dental floss is, uh, has, been used, has been used since prehistoric times. And uh, the dental floss was uh, invented by Levi Pierce uh, Spear Palmley. And initially, it began with the use of silk thread in patients. The main oral hygiene aid used was the used in India are toothbrushes, toothpaste, tooth powder, along with neem stick, bamboo, charcoal, brick powder, etc. But even though we are using all these aids, the use of dental floss is very less. It is only 15.8% in India. And it is mainly because of the lack of awareness amongst the people and uh, also the prescription practices of dentists. Hence, it becomes very necessary for the dental students to have positive attitude towards oral health care so that the society can be benefited at large. To conclude, 
only 26.72 percent of students themselves use dental floss. Hence, knowledge about preventive healthcare should be included in dental curriculum, especially including preclinical students. Clinical UG and PG students had had better attitude and awareness towards oral hygiene than preclinical students. It can be attributed to their increased knowledge and clinical experience. Students also think about the socio-economic status of the patients before prescribing the dental floss. Uh, there are many patients who visit the government hospitals who cannot afford uh, the use of or buying of the dental floss and using it. So the students or the doctors have to think without, before prescribing it to the patients. Hence, uh, the, the we should always focus on the dental students. So they, the dental students, if at the beginning of their course, are are taught and their, their attitude and seriousness uh, are made serious about the use of dental floss, then only they can uh, educate their patients to use dental floss. And secondly, students look up to their faculty for guidance. So faculty should make some efforts to shape the future role models. And hence the faculty the will teach the students and ultimately the budding dentists will then educate the people. And in this way, we may have more number of people using the dental floss and ultimately maintaining their oral hygiene at large. These are my references. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for a nice presentations delivered by you. Uh, any questions regarding to this presentations? So may you ask, I think so there is no question from the audience side. So now I would like to invite Dr. Sanjay S. Kumar, uh, who is a state IDA 13. Actually, I earlier called to you. Yes, sir. But, uh, yes, sir. You were not present. So now no, I will present. Please uh, start your presentation. Please okay. share your screen and start your presentation. Okay, sir. After that, Dr. Chinta S. Mani, please ready to or deliver your talk. Yes, sir. Screen is visible, sir? Yes, 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 visible. Uh, please share your uh, screen, Dr. Sanjay. Yes, sir. One minute. Now, sir? No visible, sir? No, sir. Please. Not visible, sir. One minute. Trying to, you trying to share your screen. Yeah, yeah. Double yes, click yes. to enter full screen mode. Yes, yes. Time lag, sir. Now you start. One minute, sir. One minute. One minute. Screen. Uh, your voice is not clear. Please start, sir. No. Uh, is it visible, sir? The screen is visible, but your voice is not clear. One minute. Uh, not sure. Now, sir. Your screen is visible. Uh, please. Uh, your screen is visible. Yes. Your voice is not clear, sir. No, no, voice is clear. No problem. Visible you... or me visible, sir. Yes, now you start. One minute, sir. It is for me not visible here. It is you are screen sharing. It is coming from my side, sir. Please go on the slide so and. Uh...
Sir, can we uh, call to the next speaker? His speaker? Yes, yes, you can call. Uh, Dr. Yes. Chintamani, yes. Yes. Dr. Yes, yes, sir. Now you can share your screen. Sir, are you, are you able to see my screen, sir? Yes, yes. Respected chairperson of the session and my co-presenters, uh, good afternoon, one and all. I am Dr. Chintamani from Stella Maris College, Chennai. On behalf of my co-author, I would like to present the paper, Best Bounds for Pekatasego Functional for the K-Through Transform of Certain Subclasses of Sakaguchi Type Functions. Watch check one second, sir. Are you able to hear me? But I couldn't smooth the screen. Yeah, the smooth uh, screen is not visible at this time. Please re reshare. Please reshare. Sir, it's completely got handled. I stop sharing and reshare, sir. Please, please reshare. Please reshare. No, sir, I couldn't do anything. Please stop your sharing and re sharing again. Hello, Dr. Chinta. Sir, Lagra in his side network a problem, is sir. Sir, Mary Avajari, sir. Jari, the next Kubula look. Ah, yeah, to go Pada now, the Pada next Next Kubula, next to Dr. Lachimi Tanwar. Dr. Lakshmi Tanwar. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson. All my dear participants. I am Dr. Lakshmi Tanwar from Sri Aurobindo College, University of Delhi. My topic is a brief study on polymer nanocomposites. Polymer nanocomposites are composites comprising polymers with different kinds of nanomaterials, such as carbon nanocube, because of their adaptability for harsh conditions these Madam, kinds your of screen is not visible i think Jesus. first you first you share your screen sir i have some problem in that full technical glitch okay. so i am okay. uh, taking okay. out okay. my no problem, no problem. Okay, you continue uh, so adaptive uh, so these uh, for example polymer nanocomposites may be used in automobiles high barrier packaging sheets for foods very strong and wear resistance coatings or materials, as well as ecological friendly composites. The major goal of this review paper is to improve tribiological properties using nanofiller based polymer nanocomposites. A car tire, for example, is often made by combining several polymers with nanofillers. As polymer nanocomposites are put to new uses, it is anticipated that tribological applications of polymer materials will advance. The primary goal of this paper is to explain 
how reinforcing affects the mechanical and tribological properties of polymer nanocomposites. This review provides introdu introduction to the intricacies of polymer nanocomposites, mechanical and tribological behavior. Polymer may be found in almost every aspect of our everyday lives. In our daily lives, polymers are found in everything from paints and adhesives to tire and clothes. Polymers may be easily processed into complicated forms uh, owing to the ease with which they can be molded. Some common features of all polymers include their low energy density, considerable intramolecular dissipation, and nanometer scale. Length using polymers in tribological application has been more popular in recent years with low weight, good strength weight, stiffness, and cheap material cost, polymer composites are appealing. These materials are used in a variety of industries, including automotive components, tires, cam sheets, gearboxes, bearing cages, biomedical devices, food, energy storage, and aerospace composite. Composites with nanoparticle fillers have lower weight fractions than those containing microparticle fillers. High, high surface area to volume ratio. Nanomaterials also stick better. A polymer nanocomposite in the nanoscale range at least one component material long. There is a polymer nanomaterial mix. It is possible to create new classes of qualities by mixing nanoparticles into the polymer matrix, but it is all but it also enhances the original polymer's predict, predicted capabilities. When Heng suggested the term nanocomposites somewhere in 1970, the PNC were already being developed in commercial and, and industrial areas by late 1980s. Since the surface chemistry and physicochemical characterization of polymer nanocomposites, they are affected by presence of nanomaterials in the matrix. Uh, controlling these qualities require knowledge of nanoparticles, shape, surface chemistry, aspect ratio, and size. As a result, PNC represents a novel class of materials with distinct advantages and more standard dope and numerous polymer material applications, including microelectronics, biological materials, sensors, energy storage, and so on. Actually, plastic nanocomposite particles are formed by dispersing rigid polymer in flexible plastic matrix at the nanoscale. Since the rigid polymers are high modulus and strength make them thermodynamic mixing of these two materials diff difficult. This combination is not recommended because of this, it is very difficult to manufacture a nanocomposite and the phase may be separate during processing. The reinforcement is influenced by both hydrodynamic and physico or chemisorption effects at the filler surface. Three primary processes are used to create nanocomposites. The first one is sol gel process. The second one is in situ intercalcative polymerization. And the third one is in situ polymerization. Many of the original polymer character characteristics as well as new qualities emerging from the nanoparticles additives may be considerably enhanced in PNCs. The advantage of nanocomposites uh, uh, are very, very diverse because nanoscale fillers are used in nanocomposites. Their performance may be enhanced by reducing the filler size and increasing the surface area in the filler is three times smaller than the typical alternative in terms of size. Now, conclude, now to conclude my topic, the polymer-based nanocomposites with improved mechanical and tribiological characteristics are the focus of this research. With molecular and mo with molecular modeling and theoretical methods to nano dentation, 
being the major emphasis research and development effort in polymer nanocomposites. Uh, now, these nanocomposites, they, uh, they are very useful in surface engineering technologies and they are now underway in order to use polymer nanocomposites in tribiological applications, different processing methods must be investigated. Polymer nanocomposites, tribiological research is still in its infancy, but we may anticipate the groundbreaking work in this area in near future due to the efforts of resin makers and Ma uh, and master batch producers, nano composite applications have acquired commercial foothold during the last several decades. Unlike the standard plastic composites, nano composites deliver these qualities with low weight impact and do so without incurring penalties. The combination of high clarity with nano composites in packaging is not conceivable with standard composites. So this was my presentation, sir. I have some glitch in the uh, screen sharing, so um, I'm sorry for that. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for delivering this uh, nice presentations. Any questions uh, regarding to this presentations from any other participants, you may ask. I think uh, there is no question from the participant side. So thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, sir. again, I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, Dr. Rasmi Mathur. Thank you, sir. Sir, this is Chintamani. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, after that, uh, Dr. Chintamani, after the Dr. Rasmi Mathur, na, yes, sir. Uh, I will allow to present your okay? Okay, sir. Uh, Dr. Chintamani, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, those people will be allowed to again, okay? While I attempt to make my uh, screen shareable, I think uh, she can go on and present her talk. I'll make my screen uh, shareable by, the, by that time. Thank you. There is a problem to sharing your screen. Uh, I'll just sort it out and just give me a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, she can start sharing. Okay. Thank you. So could you allow Dr. Chintamani to present my, uh, while I uh, sort my slide presentation? Me, uh, are you? 
Are I'm having a little bit of trouble. Just give me a few minutes. Meanwhile, Dr. Chintamani okay, okay, can okay. give a Dr. presentation. Dr. Chintamani. Yes, sir. I'll, uh, okay, okay, sir. I'll share. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes, Vijay. Please continue and start your work. Okay. Then my research paper is titled Best Bounds for Fecatus Ego Functional for the K through transform of certain subclasses of Sakaguchi type functions. On behalf of my co author, I'm presenting this paper. In recent research, working on coefficient bounds is very popular and useful to deal with geometric properties of the underlying functions. In this work, two new subclasses of Sakaguchi type functions with respect to symmetric points through subordination are considered. Moreover, the initial coefficients and the sharp upper bounds for the functional modulus of rho 2k plus 1 minus mu rho k plus 1 the whole square corresponding to the k through transformation belong to the above two newly derived subclasses are obtained and thoroughly investigated. So let's begin with always the geometry function theory. This begins with the analytic functions. So we define the class of analytic functions by the notation capital A. A be the class of functions of the form f of z is equal to z plus summation a in z bar n where n ranges from 1 to infinity. And these are all analytic functions in the open unit disk U. And they are normalized by the conditions f of 0 is equal to 0 and f dash of 0 is equal to 1. Then we move on to the class S, which is a subclass of the analytic functions class A, where the univalency is imposed on it. Now we use the tool subordination here for this paper. Uh, this is called subordination, where we can find the subordination between the two analytic functions, namely F and G, by using the analytic function W of Z through the relation W of 0 is equal to 0, and modulus of W of Z less than 1. And Henkel determinants, this is a predominant tool used in the geometry function theory for given parameters q and n belongs to the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, etc. The Henkel determinant hq n of f was considered by Noonan Thomas for a function f of z belongs to the starlight function of the form a one defined in the equation number 1.1 given by the determinant a n a n plus 1, etc. a n plus q minus 1 up to the last row a n plus q minus 1, etc. up to a n plus 2k minus 2 where the coefficient a1 equals to 1 always. Here we concentrate on the Fekete Zigo functional where it can be derived by h2 of 1 comma f by giving the restrictions of q, restrictions on q and n as 2 and 1. So which is equal to modulus of a3 minus a2 square. Fekete Zigo then further generalized as they estimate modulus of a3 minus mu a2 square where mu is any complex number. And in this paper, the sharp upper bounds of this Fekete-Zigo functional for the two newly derived subclasses are derived. And to get the desired results, we need some basic definitions. The first definition, star-like function with respect to the symmetric points. A function belongs to A, belongs to the class S star of lambda delta M, if it satisfies the condition given in equation number one, where the restrictions on the uh, parameters lambda, delta, and M are given here. Similarly, we can uh, uh, define the convex function with respect to the symmetric points uh, as uh, here, as defined here. Any function f belongs to A is said to be in the class C is lambda delta M if it satisfies this condition given in the equation number two. And there is a relation between the star-like function and convex function. Uh, Robertson has uh, established the relation between these two as Z f dash belongs to S star if and only if f belongs to C S. Where C is denotes the complex uh, convex functions with respect to the symmetric points, and S star denotes the uh, star like function with respect to the symmetric points. And these two classes are introduced and studied by Sakaguchi. And to introduce our class, our subclass, we need uh, we need uh, we are including one more parameter phi, and we can define the parameter phi like this. So phi of z is equal to one plus b one z plus b two z square etc. It's a univalent star like function with respect to one, which maps the unit disk U onto a region in the right of plane, which is symmetric with respect to the real axis. So any function f belongs to A is in this 
class s star of lambda delta m phi if it satisfies this uh, this relation given in the equation number 3 so similarly we can uh, extend the c lambda delta m to cs lambda delta m phi by uh, by using this relation and here also we can establish the relation between s star of lambda delta m phi and cs lambda delta m phi so we so we can uh, give the we can get the restricted class by putting this uh, 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 restrictions on phi of z lambda delta m and so on. So by putting a phi of z one uh, as one plus z by one minus z, we will get uh, get back s star and c s which are studied by Sakaguchi. And similarly, by putting lambda is equal to zero, delta is equal to zero, and m is equal to minus one, we will get the same classes which are studied by Panikrahma. Now we are entering into our results. So first we define what is called k through transform. So let k be a positive integer, and for any univalent function f of the form defined in the equation number one point one, the k through transform is defined like this. That is, capital F of z is equal to f of z k the whole power one by k. When we expand this uh, f of z k power one by uh, power one by k, we will get this equation. Z plus summation is equal to one to infinity rho n k plus one z bar n k plus one. And if we uh, move further, when we apply all the techniques, uh, just an expansion, we will get the initial coefficients rho k plus one as a two by k, rho two k plus one, rho three k plus one, and so on. So we can find up to as uh, as per our wish. But here, since we are going to find the Takadazigo coefficient functional, we need only these two coefficients rho two k plus one and rho k plus one. Uh, rho k plus one. After finding that, we can uh, uh, substitute in this, so to, we can get the Fekete-Sigo coefficient functional. So now we are moving into the coefficient bounds for the functions belonging to the newly defined subclasses. So to prove that, uh, we need the lemma, which is given here in this uh, in this slide, and uh, lemma two. Okay. So for this, uh, for for better understanding. So uh, we can define uh, uh, delta. So delta is the class of analytic functions W, which are normalized by W of zero is equal to zero, satisfying the condition modulus of W of z less than one. Okay. And W of z is expanded like this: W one z plus W two z square plus W three z cube, etc. And this uh, lemma plays a vital role in proving this main result. And lemma two it gives a relation between W two and W one by by this equation. Now this is the main result uh, theorem one. Uh, here we have established two theorems, and uh, we have idea to uh, extend further more. For zero, less than or equal to lambda less than one. For zero, less than or equal to delta less than one, and m is not equal to one, which is uh, with the condition modulus of m less than or equal to one. As we uh, seen before, phi of z is defined like this. So we get the Fekete-Zigo functional, which is mentioned on the left hand side, has this maximum bound. Uh, as given in the equation number two, and and moreover, this result is sharp. This result has the equal to sign for particular functions. That function is discussed later. So, uh, shall we go with the proof, sir? So, to for uh, to see the proof, we will start with the function f, which belongs to the uh, class S star of lambda delta m phi. And there exists a function, Schwartz function, W of z belongs to delta, with the conditions W of zero is equal to zero and modulus of W of z less than one. Since it belongs to this subclass, we will have the subordination condition on expansion of f of z, f dash of z, f double dash of z, f double dash of z, and by substituting the phi of z, we can have the expansion. And by comparing the left hand, left, uh, right, left hand side and right hand side, we will have the initial coefficients a two, a three, a four, and etc. Since we are dealing with the Fekete-Zigo functional, here we are interested only with the coefficients a two and a three. And uh, since uh, uh, we are considering the k through transformation of f of z, we have capital f of z. So by the definition of the capital f of z, which is equal to f of z k the whole power one by k, we will expand that uh, capital f of z, and we have the coefficients rho k plus one is equal to a two by k. And row two k plus one is equal to a three by k plus one minus k by two k square a two square. There are a lot of computations between these uh, lines, sir. I didn't show those uh, steps. And after substituting, we, uh, we can get the Fekete-Zigo functional for S star of lambda uh, delta phi uh, m phi as given in the equation number five. And it is noted that the result is sharp for the extremal function. 
given by z by 1 plus z squared. So for this function, we can get the sharp result. And uh, corollary, let the function f belongs to A be in the class as star of lambda delta m phi. Then for any complex number mu, it is clear that we will get this modulus of a3 minus mu a2 square less than or equal to, which is given in this equation. Uh, and, and, and also this result is sharp. And by putting lambda is equal to zero, delta is equal to zero, m is equal to minus one, some conditions, some restrictions on the parameters, we will get the factor zero functional for the classes which are studied by D. Panigrahi. And by giving mu is equal to one, uh, we, we will get the same, uh, we will get the result which is already discussed for the class S star, which is introduced by Shanmugam Eaton. So, as we studied for the class S star of lambda delta m phi, we can derive the factor zero functional for the class CS lambda delta m phi, and we can uh, proceed, uh, proceed for the same procedure as we did for the class S star of lambda delta m phi. So, this result is also sharp for the um, uh, function for the external function 1 plus z by 1 minus z. And uh, this is our main result, sir. And uh, uh, we can see a lot of applications of complex analysis in various fields. Here I have mentioned only two. Uh, one is signal processing and image processing. In signal processing, we can see uh, filters available uh, because the filters actually, it's, it may be a device or it may be a program which filters uh, the unnecessary uh, noises or the un un unwanted ele elements which are present there. So by using the Chebyshev uh, uh, um, filter approximation or Bessel uh, 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 approximation, and there are so many approximations. Uh, we can name we can name them as Butterworth uh, uh, approximation. So we can make use of those approximations uh, by in signal processing to eliminate the unwanted elements in that. Similarly, in image processing, the uh, we can use these tools and techniques uh, to check the images are linear, separable, or not. In this regard, the convex functions or complex files are uh, utilized. And for future work, the results can be extended uh, to second Henkel determinants, uh, third Henkel determinants, or any other higher order Henkel determinants by computing the higher initial coefficients. As we have stopped here with A2, A3, we can, uh, we can extend uh, more and can get uh, the higher order Henkel determinants. Mm. Please, uh, ma'am, conclude your. Mm. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, very yes, nice. Sir. I will present, sir. Yes, yes. So, oh, thank you, ma'am. And. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Sanju Sunde. Yes, sir. Yes. Please share your screen. One minute, sir. Sharing slide. Now visible, sir. Slide. Yes, sir. The slide is visible? Yes, it's visible now. Oh, okay. One minute, sir, I will start. Sir, one minute. So research presentation on assist the knowledge of high risk status among antenatal mothers at selected hospitals at Vadodara, Gujarat. My ID number is A13. Introduction, pregnancy is a physiological process of developing fetus within maternal body. The term high risk pregnancy is used to help can provide democratic pregnancy in which the mother or her fetus or both are high risk for developing the complication during pregnancy or childbirth. 
than in normal pregnancy. The pregnant women under 17 or over 35 are considered as high risk pregnancy and being pregnant with multiple babies, having history of complicated pregnancy, such as preterm labor, caesarean section, pregnancy loss, or having child with birth defect or family stop genetic condition. Globally, over 30,000 women die each year during pregnancy and childbirth, predominantly as a result of pregnancy and birth-related complication. Based on the Department of Statistics in India 2015 to 2021, the total number of maternal deaths, 134 in every 1 lakh, population, 1 lakh uh, pregnant mothers. Then total number of intra-uterine deaths, 305 every 1 lakh live birth. The need for study. The all pregnancies are risk for even though most of the pregnancy and childbirth worldwide are uneventful. Inadequate knowledge, incorrect, uh, incorrect attitude leads to the risk of high risk status among antenatal mother. The identification of high risk pregnancy causes and complications through quality antenatal care helps to achieve favorable maternal, obstetric, and neonatal outcomes and also it will be useful in directing the appropriate intervention measure for pregnant mother. The objectives of the study to assist the level of knowledge status among antenatal mother regarding higher status. Second one, to find out the association between higher status and selected sociodemographic variables. The material and methods I used for study, study area and period. Study was conducted in Parul Seva Ashram Hospital, Vadodara, among antenatal mother uh, from February to March 2022. Study design, so we have used quantity to descriptive research design was adopted. Population, source of population, all antenatal mother attending ANC services, services at Parul Seva Ashram Hospital. Study population, antenatal mother who are willing to participate in this study. Then sample size, you have used 60 antenatal mothers. Then variable, independent variable in this independent variable are age, gender, religion, educational status, occupation, family income, marital status. And dependent variable is knowledge of antenatal mother regarding high-risk pregnancy. Then result shows that in social demographic characteristics of the respondent, age of the mother in that 46.7% of a mother age group between 18 to 25 years and 8.3% are 36 to 45 years. In religion, 75% are Hindu religion and 10% are Muslim religion. In residential area, in that 55% of mothers living in semi rural area and 15% are uh, uh, living, 10% are living in urban area. In educational status, in that 56.7% of mother have primary education and 13.3% of mothers having higher secondary and above. In employment status, in that 38.3% of mothers having part-time workers and 3.3% of mothers having full-time workers. The next uh, na number of earning members in the family, 36.7% are three members and 16.7% are one member. In monthly income, in that 48.3% the mothers were having the family monthly income less than 10,000 and in 8.3 percent having 26 to 50,000 uh, in monthly income. Then marital status, 85 percent of the mother are married and 6.7 percent are divorced. And next come to family type in that 56.7 percent of the mother living in nuclear family and 6.7 percent the mothers living in 1.7 percent mothers living in single parent family. Then any addiction, so in that 81.7% no addiction, uh, any addiction about the mother and 3.3% mother having drugs, drug addiction. Then knowledge level of continental mother regarding high risk status in that 60% of the mother having average knowledge and 21.7% having poor knowledge, 18.3% of the mothers having good knowledge. The next association between dependent and independent variable in that age of the mother, religion, uh, in that religion and uh, educational status. So these are association with the work. Uh, this one, 
independent variable. So uh, p values less than 0 0.05. So result uh, shows that Uh, educational status and uh, religion, of the, uh, religion of the mothers are significant with p value less than 0 0.05. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, please conclude your work, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. One minute. One. Please. So we have identified in this study conclusion. So most of the mother having uh, less knowledge about high risk status. So if you provide proper antenatal checkup, the mother taken proper nutritious diet, antenatal exercise, and we can easily mother can gain good knowledge about high risk status during pregnancy like do have hypertension, diabetes, any infection. So the result shows that sociodemographical variable such as age of the mother, resident employment status, earning member in the family, family monthly income, marital status, eating habits, any addiction were non-significant with P values less than 0 0.05. Then religion, educational status, significant at P value, less than 0 0.05 level. Hence, religion and educational status of the mother affect the knowledge level of high status among antenatal mother. So study concluded that, so the antenatal mother had some knowledge about high status during pregnancy regarding association between knowledge and high status antenatal mother selected sociodemographical variable provided educational to the antenatal mother regarding antenatal checkup properly, then antenatal follow-up during pregnancy, exercise, proper follow-up care with the hospital. So we can easily prevent high risk status among antenatal mother. So these are the references. So thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for presentation. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ashmi Mathur. Rashmi Mathur, Dr. Rashmi Mathur. Yes, sir, just presenting. Yes. While somebody else is presenting, I'm not able to share. I do not know how to do this. Just give me a couple of moments.
I don't think it was. Or getting behind or such. If you facing uh, sharing your screen, please uh, uh, orally you may present. Okay. 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 So very good afternoon, everyone. The topic of this presentation, uh, this oral presentation is phytoremediation and innovative green cleanup technology. The word phytoremediation is, it consists of, just, just give me a moment, maybe I'll try one more time. Is next uh, is speaker present, Dr. Harish Rajak. Dr. Harish Rajak. I think so. Dr. Harish Rajak is not here. Ma'am, if possible, uh, then continue otherwise. Uh, there are some photos which I had to, uh, you know, show, and uh, that's the reason I wanted the slide to show up. But anyway, I just uh, made my presentation. To, uh, so, so, slide so, so you may present orally. You can dictate. Okay. Okay. You can that's read. Right. Okay. Otherwise, we are closing this session, and next okay. session will be start at 5 p.m. Okay. So, uh, Again, uh, just anyway, start, man, uh, okay. any, uh, uh, anyway, you mm -hmm. are you are facing problems, so don't worry. Uh, you may share your PPT, you know, in this uh, email ID. Okay. So because okay. you are you are facing some more problems, so you are unable to yeah, right. present your work. So our next speaker, Dr. Harish Rajak. I think uh, Dr. Harish Rajak is not here. So. After 10 minute uh, break, uh, we will start our next session, which will be start at 5 p.m. And uh, 
there are one main session and other is the parallel session main session will be in the same login password uh the stack id a25 to a30 hai yeah, na uh, dr kushum dobriyal dr vikas uh, dr anupama arya dr sudhakar rao dr salu sachdeva dr niludhar uh in in parallel session a31 to a36 dr rahnuma parvez mrs sri kripa dr kripa mrs uh, rachel nisa and uh, mrs sukancha singh and dr kruti so after 10 minutes uh, we will start main session and parallel session also excuse me sir the id will be different sir नहीं तो आईडी 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 सर इन program schedule okay thanks sir for a31 to a36 uh, the login password written in the program schedule yes, in sir. parallel session okay right sir so the session will be chair dr sheta so all these things mentions in our program schedule and as, as i think very clear in all these thing in program schedule okay so we we will wait 10 minutes is it okay do i continue yes yes you may continue okay okay so um the topic of Uh, this oral presentation is phyto remediation and the word phyto remediation combines the greek word phyto which means plant and the latin word remedium which means to correct or remove or restore balance bio remediation has the potential to mitigate environmental problems without the need to excavate the contaminant material and worrying about disposing it elsewhere phyto remediation is an emerging cost efficient plant based approach it takes advantage of the natural ability of various species of green plants and associated microbes to bioaccumulate degrade eliminate extract immobilize or render harmless the contaminant elements and compounds from the environment and metabolize various molecules within their tissues the promising technology particularly tar targets mitigation of pollutants such as heavy metals like lead mercury arsenic cadmium and uranium organic pollutants such as polynuclear unsaturated hydrocarbons polychlorinated biphenyls pesticides residues solvents explosives crude oil and derivatives etc from the contaminated soil and water all plants cannot accumulate heavy metals or organic pollutants different species differ in their physiology and therefore they have varying abilities to accumulate pollutants the selection of plant depends on the nature of the contaminant the soil type the texture and the regional climate the selected plant should have the ability to tolerate both essential and non essential metals in high concentration in their foliage it should have the ability to accumulate extract or degrade huge amounts of the targeted contaminant it should have the ability to translocate the contaminant to the harvestable part of the plant and the plant part should be easy to harvest it should be a fast growing plant with high biomass it should be non edible by humans or animals it should have a widespread highly branched root system it should have the ability to take up large quantities of water through roots it should be an easy to maintain plant with high resistance to disease and insect problems additionally it should be tolerant to abiotic stresses like climate and site stresses okay the next slide was to show some plants uh, with the potential for uh, phytoremediation 
So a large number of plant species, almost 350, are known to possess the genetic potential to remove, degrade, metabolize, or immobilize a wide range of contaminants from the soil and water. Some of the fast-growing plants, such as Salix, Populus, and Jatropha, could be used for phytoremediation in addition to energy production. Sorgastrum mutans is preferred for phytoremediation due to its fast growth. Maize, Indian mustard, and sunflower are known to tolerate heavy metals and are often used to remediate the polluted soil. Two halophytes, Sueda martinia and Suvium portulacastrum, are best suited for removal of salts from the rhizosphere. There are various types of phytoremediation. Phytoextraction is the hyperaccumulation of the harvestable plant part for inorganic contaminants like cobalt, chromium, nickel, lead, zinc, mercury, molybdenum, and cadmium. Radionuclides like cesium, strontium, and uranium. And plants that have been found to have phytoextraction potential are Brassica gentia and Helianthus anus. The next kind of phytoremediation is phytodegradation, which involves the eradication of herbicides. Plants having phytodegradation potential are popular stonework. Volatilization is the volatilization by leaves through transpiration of organic contaminants like chlorinated solvents and inorganic contaminants like selenium, mercury, and arsenic. Plants that have been found to have phytovolatilization potential are Arabidopsis thaliana, Populars alpha alpha, and Brassica gentria. Phytostabilization is the complexation, sorption, precipitation of inorganics like arsenic, cadmium, copper, chromium, lead, and zinc. Plants having phytostabilization potential are Brassica gentia, Populars, and grass. Rhizofiltration involves the accumulation through sorption, concentration, and precipitation of inorganic contaminants like cadmium, copper, nickel, zinc, and chromium, and some radionuclides. Plants having rhizofiltration potential are Brassica gentia, Helianthus anus, tobacco, rye, spinach, and corn. Some of the applications of phytoremediation are that it is useful in cleaning up contaminated soil and water environments. Contaminants like metal pesticides, metals, pesticides, solvents, explosives, and crude oil have all been mitigated in phytoremediation projects worldwide. Many plants like mustard, hemp, and amaranthus have proven to be successful at hyperaccumulating contaminants at toxic waste sites. Certain plants like willow and jatropha that are fast growing and have high biomass could be used for both phytoremediation and for energy production. The advantages of phytoremediation are that it is eco-friendly and sustainable since it uses plants that are found everywhere for the cleanup of contaminated environments. It is the least harmful method because it uses naturally occurring organisms with minimal associated environmental disturbance and the ability to leave soil in a usable condition following the treatment. Plants that engage in phytoremediation of toxic elements could be harvested, thereby removing these elements from the polluted site. It provides an opportunity to recover and reuse the valuable metals. The metal contaminant can subsequently be recycled from the contaminated plant biomass. It improves the soil health and maintains the fertility of the topsoil. It is inexpensive compared to the conventional methods. There are a number of disadvantages. Right? Huh? Continue, continue. The advantages of the technique are that it does not remove toxic heavy metals, but rather relocates them. The survival of the plant is affected by the degree of toxicity of the contaminant soil and water. Furthermore, phytoremediation is limited to rhizosphere, which is the area which is occupied by the roots. 
slow growth and low biomass make it a time consuming and very long term remediation process. With plant based systems of remediation, it is not possible to completely prevent the leaching of contaminants into the groundwater. The survival of the plant is affected by the toxicity of the contaminated land and the general condition of the soil. When taking up heavy metal, sometimes the metal is bound to the soil organic matter, which makes it unavailable for the plant to extract. Another drawback is that the approach is possibly uh, the sorry, the approach is the possibility of contaminate contaminants entering the food chain through the agricultural products and eventually accumulating in humans through biomagnification. It is an efficient, clean, cheap, and sustainable environmental technology and is very promising, but still it is in an early stage of development because most of the experiments are at the research and development phase. And there are many technical barriers to this approach that need to be addressed. Many hyperaccumulator plants remain yet to be discovered, and there is a need to understand their physiology in greater depth. The proper understanding of heavy metal uptake by plants and the method for properly disposing of the biomass produced are still needed. A better understanding of the molecular basis of the pathway involved in the degradation of pollutant is needed. Further analysis and discovery of the genes suitable for phytoremediation is also essential. Field testing of transgenic plants for phytoremediation is very limited. Biosafety concerns need to be properly addressed to prevent the gene flow into wild species. Phytoremediation technologies Can are currently... conclude your work? Yes, I will. Uh, phytoremediation technologies, uh, just to continue, currently are available only for a small number of pollutants. The possibility of using biotechnology to improve the efficiency of phytoremediation process makes it even better than any other existing method. The knowledge of genetic engineering may prove to be critical in enhancing phytoremediation capabilities or for introducing new capabilities into plants. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, ma'am, for a nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, now we are going to start next session, uh, 825 to 830. Now I would like to invite Dr. Kusum. Dr. Kusum. Dr. Kusum. Dr. Vikas. Dr. Vikas. Dr. Vikas, please reply. Please me, uh, unmute yourself. Dr. Anupama Arya. Yes, sir. Uh, please, uh, please share your screen and uh, present your work. Please. Yes. Good evening, all of you. Uh, so, am I audible? My uh, screen is visible? Yes, yes, your screen is visible. Please, ma'am, continue. Thank you, sir. For first of all, thank, special thanks to you, sir, giving me opportunity. I, I was uh, delayed with the uh, this presentation uh, earlier. I was not able to send you in time. 
So uh, I'll start today. Uh, very good evening uh, to all of you. The nation, the, the, uh, I'm Dr. Anupam Arya. I'm Associate Professor in Department of Community Medicine. Uh, I'm from uh, Government Room Medical College, Dehradun, Uttarakhand. So the title of my uh, article is The Nation, nation of Health Seeking Behavior and Social Determinants of Health Towards Health Equity. So the introduction part, a range of factors that mind health, including genetic, social, environmental, and physical behavior, uh, and medical care. The present view of health and illness recognize health as more than just the absence of the disease. Because the concept of the health-seeking behavior has gained popularity in recent years as an important tool for exploring and understanding patient preferences, strategies, and the people used to decide which option we have to use at which stage of the illness, delays in diagnosis and actions across a variety of health conditions. So the elements uh, of the words, which is very, very important to know that that is what is health equity. Health equity is defined as the absence of the unfair and avoidable or remedial differences in health among population groups, defined socially, economically, 